Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and what a lovely Sunday afternoon it is, at least here on the East Coast, where I am. I am Kyle Corvus Crow, and I am joined at the cast today by Sin. It is a pleasure to be here with you, Sin. Yeah, it's, uh, looking forward to getting into the games. We've got a few bands on the board already, but it is oh, going to yeah. be on the, on the blue side. It's going to be Cornell, the red side. It's going to be UMass. So uh, excited to see what these two teams bring out. Some uh, really interesting bands coming out from UMass already. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they've already taken away Azir and Gallio uh, against the side of Cornell. Don't want to see either of those. And then Janna will be the last one on the docket for their side. Over on the side of Cornell, it's a little bit more standard. Ezreal, Kogma, Zaya taken off. So a lot of AD potential jungle there as well. Off the board with a Sejuani hover for the first pick. So what we, what we can look at here is the fact that they banned the two hyper carry ADCs and the Ezreal as well, so it kind of tends towards the fact that they want to avoid the opponents playing this Ardent Sensor style. And if they mm -hmm. want to, they'll have to fall back onto something like the Twitch. And uh, at the same time, Janna banned on the other side, so... Interesting, maybe neither team really wants to pick up this. And uh, the Sejuani first pick is one of the strong, uh, stronger junglers in the game. She does really require a little bit of setup time, she can't really gank level 2, level 3. She needs to wait until sort of around the level 5 mark to consistently get those... Uh, stuns off when she comes in for a gank and then when she hits level six obviously having the ultimate available can be even more detrimental to be able to find picks consistently and we saw a little bit in the play-ins last night what she can do when it was uh c9 versus the direwolves oh yeah sneaky <laughs> feeling the brunt of that pick very strong champion in current meta right now but umass doesn't seem too phased by that they're gonna pick up ivern in the first round blitz as well specifically the ivern pick i feel for his enemy there says, I'm not too interested in the Sejuani. I want to play this game out a little bit differently. And you go ahead and take that first pick, because we're still going to take away what we want in this early round of the draft. And a Blitzcrank to boot as well means so an gonna, interesting bot lane setup. I'm going to leave the Ivern for a minute, because potentially what the Blitzcrank could have left up, and it doesn't look like it's going to be, it left up the availability to go Morgana into it. Mm. In which case, or you can just put the uh, black shield on somebody who's about to be hooked, and then they're fine. Although Tristana has something to the similar effect, where you can buffer the pull into the rocket jump. Mm. You can jump away while he's actually pulling you through the air. It makes it a little bit safer lane for Tristana, regardless of the fact that it should be unsafe with the Blitzcrank. But then to go back to the Ivern, this is a champion that could go uh, Ardent Sensor itself, and then you can avoid going for it in the support role. Uh, it was known previously for going Redemption first, but now with the rise of the shielding items other than Redemption being strong, he could go Athene's Ardent Sensor and still have a really large impact on the game, similar to how he would have done before the nerfs. Mm. Very interesting. Gonna be curious to see if that one does come out, because that is a little bit harder to execute, but that would be on the back then of the most talented player for UMass's roster, right? If we're going just by rank, it does seem to be their jungle fuse enemy there leading the team, so... I mean, it does show up as challenge over, uh, that's the flex Q rank. He is D1, which is still the highest in the team, but I do give you credit there. Sure. Uh, and we can see, interestingly now, though, with the mid laner and the top top laners, neither of them selected on either side. We're seeing a few bands head those ways, and uh, with the Cassiopeia taken off of the board, we could see something like a Talia dramatically rise in priority, and we could see Fapdo go for that as the first pick of the second rotation of picks. Uh, knowing it. that a lot of the counters are really off the board already, because... Uh, Azir, one of the pokey mid lane mages, is now gone. Uh, Cassiopeia, who can just use that Miasma to completely lock you down and chase you down the lane as well. Does seem to be a little bit of a top lane focus as three top laners banned out this rotation, and only the Cassio forced out from the side of UMass. So, would be expecting them to see a top laner pick here, leaving then mid lane for counter. Fiora would definitely fit well into that. She has been played. Sometimes in the mid lane, but Corky, on the other hand, throwing down a little bit of a gauntlet there, says, pick what you want, we'll be fine. Yeah, Corky, an inherently safe pick in the mid lane, so he's going to be just happy to pick that one up and save the counter pick for his top lane. Uh, he doesn't really need to go aggressive and pick the Fiora there, because then that does leave you open to maybe some less favorable matchups, the likes of the Jace in the top lane, 
So mm. leaving the counter pick there, if you're going for this carry top lane, which we see from the bands of Gnar and Renekton, maybe they could opt towards. Uh, it seems the best option to hold that pick, knowing that there's so many safe mid laners available. And interesting, Kassadin pick is going to be locked in here with that magic damage shield with the corky changes to make him more magic damage focused. So mm. it could work out wonders for him. I definitely agree with you there. And a Jarvan pick being hovered would round out this composition with a very strong team fight the way they want to pull this one in. Tristana to back line it, Sejuani and Jarvan to take up all your attention on the front while Cassidy just rip walks all over your team. I love it, but we'll see what uh, UMass comes back around with here because their composition does look a little bit more scattered in what it wants to do, but it could play around a team comp, uh, fight based team comp pretty well if they pick their battles. So if we were looking at the earlier phases of the pick and ban and the little bit to the hovers, you could have uh, actually seen the Fiora locked in there. Fiora notoriously a good matchup into Jarvan, where you can actually uh, repost the EQ, you can repost the Cataclysm and uh, reduce all the damage from that, and of course just dash straight out of it. There's nothing really much Jarvan can do about it. So it would have been interesting to see him go for that, but instead goes for the Urgot top lane. Mm. This is not a pick we see commonly, but at this Bruiser-style top laner, uh, can really be detrimental to an opponent because he is of course still ranged and he has the ability to dash around as well with the e he's got the w to auto attack while moving around and it makes him actually able to dodge out things a lot easier than maybe some other top laners would be mm. absolutely correct there delayed trades coming out from cornell here we'll see that or just not in order right yeah i was wondering that as well if uh we were going to be, yeah, the summoners make it look like they're just not in order there, so. Interesting that they actually the picked order. in the order of their picks. Yeah, they didn't have anything to trade around, so their priorities were uh, definitely right where they left them. So, a little so thrown off by that, but not too bad. Going, um, we'll actually lay ourselves out in the order of our pick priority. Mm. And uh, it seems to have worked out for them anyway, because they haven't been punished for it whatsoever. And uh, we'll have to see how it's going to come. Uh, the game is going to come along because we have got the Arden Sensor plus double ADC here, mm. and yeah. uh, that's what that's what we're going to see on one side. But on the other side, trying to be avoiding that uh, item and uh, not ne not necessarily valuing it as much as some others do, as we're going to see the single lady carry with a playmaking support. So wants to snowball off of the early game, land a few hooks, make some plays, and. Uh, get a small advantage so you don't necessarily need to worry about your opposing item spikes because you've spiked even harder slightly earlier than them. Yeah, definitely leaves a lot of doors open there uh, for the way that they want to play that one out. Power spiking, so critical, and so few teams actually seem to be able to play off of it the right way uh, in mid, lower, and even some high-tier league just below pro level. You see teams not managing their gold very well in terms of what they can buy. They get high on themselves because they have these massive amount of kills, right? And then they don't actually go back and spend the gold and sometimes end up letting somebody crawl back in through that. But isn't uh, something we expect to see here, perhaps, more so just a danger that they should be on the lookout for. Interesting. So referring to the power spikes that you like, uh, like you are there, we've got to talk about the core key here. It's not a pick that's really the highest priority in the meta, but it's something that consistently shows up one or two games here or there, and uh, since the Corky changes to make him more magic damage focused, he was uh, returned back to the mid lane, Trinity Force changes hit him quite a while back, and he never quite recovered from it, mm. but now, with the magic damage auto attacks, you get like 80% of your magic damage uh, <laughs> on, on auto attacks, it's uh, really hard to, it was really hard to itemize it against because it was 50-50 before, but now, it's really difficult to slot in that much magic resist into a build when you know uh, they've got the double AD carry setup. He's going to be critting you massively in the late game, and he spikes really hard off the Trinity Force. He spikes really hard off of Trinity Force plus the magic penetration boots. Then he spikes hard off of that plus Infinity Edge. Then he spikes hard off of that. It's just a never ending it's... chain of power spikes, and it snowballs him into the late game so perfectly if you can get an advantage in those earlier phases of the game. And if he's against the Cassadin, which is notorious for not being that strong pre level six, mm -hmm. he might be able to find a couple of uh, punishing ganks from the Ivern. If Ivern lands one of those root callers, he could die almost instantly. And there we go into uh, a snowballing Corky, and that's where this big threat can come from. I think, as well, they have more tools at their disposal than just the Ivern to make this happen, right? Blitzcrank, in particular, a champion that can 
roam almost unsuspectingly outside of lane. You never know if he's just back to buy or if he's run straight up to mid lane to gank your pre-6 very immobile Cassidy. So they have definite tools at their disposal to get that ball rolling. And it does seem like Corky would be the basket to put all of those eggs in, right? He can yeah. just so versatile. He has such versatility to his kit that he can play around just about any point in the game. Whereas, you know, with the likes of the Callista on your team, the really the rest of your team's damage there, um, you do have to wait a little bit longer for that to get rolling. So at least pre-15 minutes, I'm expecting mid lane to be the story of this game with a little bit of a little bit of bot lane drama sprinkled in here and there. So you can definitely understand why they would try and punish the Cassadin. Obviously, he doesn't have any mobility pre-level 6 from the ultimate. So uh, you could see the Blitzcrank roam up there, but what I want to refer to a little bit here is the fact that they've got the Blitzcrank teamed up with the Callista. And one of the reasons you could consider this is the fact that Blitzcrank, although he has the massive pressure he can provide from knowing that the hook is available, other than that, he doesn't give any trading potential. He really has to be all in or nothing, and that can lead him to getting traded out in the bot lane and really struggle to get any sort of advantage or fall behind on CS, but he's t teamed up with one of the most lane-dominant ADCs, Callista, where she can constantly rip those spears out of those minions, get the reset on the E, the mana reset as well, and chunk the opposing laners at the time. So the way this works is you land an auto in a minion that's low, you land an auto in the champion, you rip it out of both, you get the full mana reset, and you chunk the opposing enemy uh, laner as well. Well, we'll see how it all plays out, ladies and gentlemen. If you are just joining us, we are getting into game number one, oh, and no. Meister Chief, rooted off the bat, just joined the game, and he may be going down his first blood. Does indeed, as Dearest Andy takes that one away. All counted on the assists, except for Fapto there. And, uh... Maybe you can see, that you can see the Corky pick up the first blood, though. That was uh, tip the typical level one where you see uh, the all of the team with the Blitzcrank roam into the enemy jungle. They catch out the Cassadin. And although it wasn't on screen, we couldn't help but talk about that because that is a crucial first blood onto Dearest Andy, who we talked about being this potential carry for the team. And uh, knowing that he has now got that extra 400 gold, that extra longsword at level one, oh, that's a big threat already. Absolutely. It's going to be just about the perfect setup for him there to get that little bit of extra damage to edge out over Cassidy, who did just start with that Dark Seal, right? So Yeah. So it's the, gonna what happen. it normally means when you start for the Dark Seal and the uh, Revitalizing Potion here, uh, the Refillable Potion, rather, uh, it normally signals that you're going to go for the Corrupting Potion as early as possible. You get the bonus healing on the Corrupting Potion from the Dark Seal, and uh, it gives you so much sustain in lane, and knowing that he doesn't have that much mana early on, knowing that his mana is very usable until he starts to get like towards the Rod of Ages, it could mean that uh, he'll have a much easier time once he gets to that point, but as we said, Dearest Andy has already got an advantage. He's 4 CS to 0 at this point. Mm. Yeah, he's really in a good position to just bully this out. Level 2, gonna delay the level 2 of Meister Chief just a little bit there, so a headache and a half for this mid lane story as he will just be able to get pretty much everything he wants out of that and that really opens up the map to fuse enemy now there on that ivern because he's not going to feel the pressure to get that off obviously he can continue to snowball the corky to his heart's content but dearest andy at this point can just do that himself if he doesn't get too aggressive and jump under a tower or anything so fuse enemy now kind of has his pick of who he wants to gank what he wants to do if he just wants to hard farm or set up lanes so we'd seen uh, uh, on the other side of that, uh, Uzi Wuzi is really going to be playing this low impact early game jungler has been seen for a long time. We have seen people adapting more and going for some more early game ganks on the Sejuani, but it's still not as early impact as plenty of other champions. You can look at the Jarvan, Lee Sin, Elise, all those sort of champions, and even the Ivern, and they can have an impact very early on, but I am Celtic caught out. Nice. Nicely done. Does turn it around with the hook, actually, so Fapto... Gonna take some trade damage, but Celtic definitely the worst for the wear in this one as he does have to flash out. Actually gonna be flashed in from Danko. He wants to continue this fight. We'll see if they try to get it, but this is so dangerous and Celtic is not there to help. Meanwhile, across the map, we got some mid lane jungle action going on. Oh no, that's not good for Celtic. Does go down. Tried to rocket jump away, but has not been able to time those as well as he thought. And now Andy's gonna keep oh. the pressure on. Meister Chief may turn this one around. He actually dies... To, uh, to the under his tower, tried to turn it around there. I don't actually think 
he was in as much danger if he tried to fight than if he just continued running because running was the death sentence for him there. Yeah. But he may he have could have gotten the kill on Andy. Hawkey was a couple auto attacks from dead, so if he just stayed and tried to auto, maybe he could have finished it off. At least tried to get a one for one and trade himself for the opposing mid laner, but instead it's going to be Dearest Andy sitting two and zero down in the bot lane. We saw Fapdo picking up uh, his first kill of the game onto the Tristana, who we've seen had a little bit of a rough time early, getting pressured out by the Callista and using that lane pressure that we talked about a little bit earlier to great effect. And there's oh, going to be definitely. Ooh, uh, the Sejuani coming top lane though. Yeah, I don't think Pool Party Sam has too many ways out of this one. Almost, but Krino knows that Uzi Woozy can just do the damage for him. He's not needing to take that last chunk of kill. So gets himself to safety away from the minions, away from the big angry Urgot, and takes a nice return point for his team there. And what should be a healthy reset in lane for him? Well, knowing that the knowing that earlier on in the game, we did see that uh, the Ivern invade bot side and see that all of Sejuani's camps were gone. So inherently she was going to be coming top lane fairly soon. Mm. And you still see Pool Party Sam going aggressively without vision uh, into a trade without knowing in, on vision where the enemy to, uh, jungler was. And he gets punished for it this time around. Uh, he gets maybe one or two autos away from taking down Krino, but that is going to be the kill going the other way. And now Krino picking up the Bramble Vest. This is specifically <laughs> potent against Urgot. Of course, you get three attacks per second when you activate the W. That's three stacks of the Bramble Vest. Uh, three Potential individual hits. Ooh. Gank coming in the mid lane here is Meister Chief is just getting the run of it today. Does what he can damage-wise back, but the bush will be... The last straw on that for him means he cannot continue to push that one out. And Dearest Andy takes away his third kill of the game. 3-0-0 zero, zero at just shy of six minutes here. This guy is going to be absolutely monstrous. And the Trinity Force known as one of those spikes that takes the longest to get in the game. But for him, he's going to find this so easily. Now 3-0 up in CS. Already got 2,600 gold in his pocket. Compared to just the 1,500 of uh, Meister Chief. Ooh, got a little bit of drama here. As Uzi Woozy's hooked over the He doesn't seem to mind to. Did want to try to continue that one. But a little second thought of that one brought him back to his senses. Said, nah, we're just going to taper off there. So jungles both spotted on the bot lane. Both gonna retreat. Actually a little bit disappointed with the way that they're playing out their vision game from both teams right now because there's so many warding opportunities that they had that they just sort of ignored there. Ooh, forcing the flash in the top lane. Pool Party Sam on the run. Don't think Krino can finish. They do, but he does blow his flash. Krino holds on to his and uh, although this should be a matchup that Urgot should be fine and the early Bramble Vest purchase has turned it in favor of Krino, and it's not even the assist gold that's turned it, it's simply the power of this item where you get the Grievous Wounds onto the opponent to reduce their healing, and of course the Thornmail passive where you take damage every time you hit them, and uh, with uh, got so much of his damage reliant on his W, he ends up taking three times as much damage, damage as he would from just auto-attacking normally. Mm. A lot of damage to take into account there, and the one saving grace for him is this mana management from Krino, I would say, because Jarvan, mana thirsty pretty early on, but he's been blowing spells left, right, and center to be winning these trades, and it's keeping him always just out of the range of executing a kill there onto Pool Party Sam. And I think Sam oh, knows fuzzy. this. Fuzzy's coming. Yeah, this could be bad. There is backup coming up from Meister Chief and Uzi Woozy, though. It's just a matter of time. Can Krino continue this one off? There's the rip walk in. It should be a nice turnaround. First kill goes down, and it looks like only a matter Daisy. of time if they do decide to dive. But yes, Daisy saves the day there for Fazenemy there. Uh, that could uh, uh, so dramatically different, but what a nice pop from Ultimate. And now Andy here actually may want to try to turn things around. It still is a 2v3. Krino no mana, though. This really finding a lot of pressure in the early game now. Uzi Woozy in this, towards the mid game where he's pressured out the Urgot. And he's come twice uh, to top lane, landed these ultimates, and netted kills. And this time he didn't both get both of them, but he got the kill onto Pool Party Sam, getting his top lane ahead a little bit more again. And this is where they have to rely on getting their advantage. Knowing that the mid lane is uh, pretty much falling to pieces, this top lane has to be won. The bot lane is falling as well, so... They're just trying to find some advantage on the map themselves. Sure. Well, it is a nice little bit of downtime that actually 
should net Dragon over to the side of UMass. I do think they should have been a little bit more diligent with their vision control, though, because it was given away. Cornell knows this. They want to go in, and Danko's taking so much damage. Great play by Blitzcrank to get the silence off. Celtic now trying to kite this one back. He's not on the run by any stretch, but he is definitely in danger if he doesn't start soon. Vapto flashing in into tower range, tries to get the rend off, but it's just not enough. And that is going to keep him alive barely. Celtic actually gets the kill credit onto Vapto, but the health bars are so low beneath this tower and Andy can clean house here. It's just a matter of how they tank it out. Pool party Sam might get himself uh -oh. in some trouble. Does go down. Meister Chief takes the credit, but Andy cleans house at the end. And oh no, Oh God. not what you wanted. Did didn't juggle it as well as possible. Credo is topside too, without teleport this entire time, so all he can do is smack this tower. Oh, what a mess. But crucially, that gets Meister Chief back into the game. The mistakes made there give him two kills and an assist. That gives him a big chunk of gold. It's nearly uh, evened out the gold between him and the opposing mid lane. They're not even going to get this bot lane tower if he can try and chase down now. Beautiful Ooh. teleport. All he needs to do is rip walk into this one. Careful on that tower there, because that is Blitzcrank oh. after all. The pull comes through, Meister Chief. No! Falling for the oldest trick in the book. That, ladies and gentlemen, is classic textbook baiting. And dearest Andy did it so well. Von der Waffel hitting the pinch hook, taking the kill away. And just as we were singing his praises, Meister Chief fumbles the ball. And that, it looked to be the turnaround where they don't get the bot lane tower. They're very close to getting the top lane one. And uh, you could see that my Meister Chief was looking at two kills, licking his lips, but that was cruelly stolen away from him. And very well done uh, by Van der Waffle, just staying out of vision, barely. So the moment that Meister Chief jumps in, he gets hooked on the tower. There have been quite a few bloody noses coming out this game. The trades are just vicious, but through it all, Dearest Andy is staying 6-0. and zero. Pool Party Sam, perhaps not going to remain deathless as a nice dive under tower they should have the health bars to pull this one off but Crino does not have the spells to continue so good play from pool party to keep himself alive there better vision would have kept him from having to blow that flash but first tower crucially taken away now goes over to umass and on that dive the shield from the purge came up huge from pool party sam because it was able to dissuade any further dive Stop them from losing the top tower, which was sub a third HP. It meant that they got the bottom one in response, so they net the first tower gold. And uh, now Here's they're looking Andy. to pressure even further. Yeah, Bobby Mike could get a fast one over on Crino, but actually does get himself in some trouble. Top laners traded away. I'm sorry, mid laner, that is Dear Sandy's first death. Pool Party Sam's A OK. -okay. It is Crino that goes down. Well, I say A OK. -okay. He was A OK. -okay. We'll see if he can stay so. He's had some fancy feet to get out of this one, but. I don't think there's much you can do with Kassan and Sejuani right in your face. Danko now, keeping things interesting across the map, on the run here. Nice bit of tower aggro does keep things in his favor, but if he's not careful, this will turn into a dive. Loosely looking at the bot lane tower and the ping on some wards, maybe uh, worried about the TP coming in from Krino. This is mm. just a few seconds away, but Danko now go. caught out. Yeah, pulled in. Van der Waffel takes that one away. I actually think it was the passive that executed him there. <laughs> so, a little bit of a thunderbolt down, smitten. Danko no longer with us today. We'll be respawning in 10 seconds. Krino was on the run in, but just didn't get there in time. Teleport was not up for him, so... It was just, I think, a misplay from Danko, right? That's all it is, because you don't have your minions. And if you don't have minions in front of you... There's no point to walking into hook range. Yeah, but now dearest Andy getting cataclysm, has to blow the flash. Ooh. Barely creep away under his tower, but they're not done. No, they take away the kill onto him. Meister Chief finds that under tower. Deals out the second, say 6-0-0, six, zero, zero, try 6-2-1. and one, And we're not done yet. We are going to keep dishing out these kills as the game continues to get bloody. Trades left, right, and center, and it's so far just been UMass squeaking out ahead in terms of the kill numbers. And Vunderwaffle's been nailing these oh. hooks, I tell you, but what a good play to keep Pool Party Sam down there. I think this is just the fact that Cornell brought more dogs to this fight, and now they are going to be continuing. Good play. That keeps Vunderwaffle in trouble, and look at that. They find his enemy on the back line there as well for a nice double down. One to the top, one to the mid, and 
for the first time, critically here, Meister Chief has surpassed Dearest Andy in kills. So now we see with those three kills, crucially they get themselves back. This is the finally the turnaround they've been waiting for. They've been on the verge of this for ages, and if they get the Rift Herald now as well, they can start to maybe look to make a proactive play, get some advantages on towers, maybe uh, siege up this middling tower, or potentially the bot lane one to get these outer towers down, press further into the enemy jungle, get the vision, which can crucially get them <gasps> back it in. Taken away. Is... Oh, that was the steal it with the stolen. Q from Callista. They have oh, to now play defense, yeah. right? They, they have, have to go to... and get the. They have to go and get the eye of the herald though first. They have oh. to be able to pressure for, uh, back into there, and Uzi Woozy is defending it. Yeah, he says no chance onto this one. Kalissa's is gonna try to hop onto it. I think that actually is the pickup. Beautiful. And now Uzi Woozy trying to play defense. Does go down in a flash from Danko. Are you kidding me, Fapdo? What have you done and how did you do it? That was insane. Amazing steal. I'm actually gonna go back and watch that again in a moment oh, when we get some goodness. respite. But that is <laughs> crucial from the Callista to be able to steal away that. And we talked about it. They've been on the verge of the comeback for ages. And once again, the door is slammed shut in the faces of Cornell. UMass, hold on to the control. <laughs> yeah, now I have to wonder, ooh, Flash Cataclysm, dearest Andy, not gonna be able to retreat. Actually, it's Crino that needs to retreat, gets out by the skin of his teeth. Dan goes on the run. I think this is probably gonna turn into a kill or two from oh, the side that's gonna be the of UMass. This is the ult. This is the ult. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Cool party Sam takes away Danko. He's down, Crino again. Gets a little bit of health back and takes it right away. Perfect time to summon Rift Herald. Callista does take it away in the top side, so that is going to be huge as this fight continues to break down. A hook from Vondervoffel to keep Celtic out of that one for a little bit. But Meister Chief going unstoppable, keeping up the pressure. Will mean they barely win the mid lane fight, but their top lane tower is now in pieces. Oh no! No way! Oh. Here is Andy. If Wait, he gets that, he certainly doesn't deserve to. Oh. The pop will take it. Celtic with the dunk, and they're not done. The reset means another kill double down now onto Vunder Waffle. And every time I try to catch my breath, these guys say no chance, keep shouting. Meister Chief with the questionable teleport into his death yet again. That's the second time we've seen him do this. That was, yeah, I think the best word for it is indeed questionable. As he costs himself his life, but now the hook landing onto Fuzzy, uh, ooh. It's going to be Danko maybe regretting that decision as now the spears are stacking up into him. Daisy did not quite get the knockup they wanted, and the tower should finish off the rest of that mossy golem there. So it's going to be Krino looking for the flank with Uzi Woozy there. Possible fight extension, but Callista, one of the better kiters, not one of the better hook dodgers, though, and does get taken down there. That will certainly be their death. Cannot do much about that. Danko gets the credit, but Uzi Woozy on the back oh, end takes the brunt of the package. damage in return. Yeah, huge package as Celtic now on the run for his life. Just gets under tower, but does go down all the same. Dearest Andy will not be denied his blood. And Meister Chief is just now joining the fight for the first time. Critical hook misses, and now that is a hook connection on the other side as Vunderwaffel takes it, so is going so to be to Danko the missing the shot. Yeah, this tower is down. There's no chance they hold on to that one. And I think if Cornell knows what's good for him, they'll just back up out of this one. The health bars are low and only Meister Chief is in fight condition right now. So we've seen the vision pressure from Cornell has been pressing rather high into the river, past the river slightly into the opposing jungle. But now the opposing mid lane tower has gone mm -hmm. down. It allows UMass to find the way into the enemy jungle and put down this vision. And maybe now they can look to punish people for face checking aggressively, and choke people out, and this gives them the control over the dragon for now. Oh no, what a hook, Meister Chief! No, he does go down, the Riftwalk will not save him, and this dragon is utterly and totally going over to you, Masseer. They will not be denied that either. Starting to pull away in this one, the back of that Rift Herald play into the top lane, I think, <laughs> really pushed it all away. Yeah, a little bit of a cheeky take away there and he gives enemy. it to dearest andy at the same time as well so even double value for the steel and uh Lovely. with this with this pressure they've now got into the opposing jungle due to the mid lane tower going down it, it means that they have full control over the game they can uh back off uh reset for gold and then look to continue their push they're just gonna need to push the waves deep uh look for where the enemy's showing up and capitalize where there are fewer numbers as we get towards the 20 minute mark if they put wards deep near the enemy blue buff they can catch people out on their way to the Baron Pit. Mm. And, uh, 
bait them into those team fights where crucially you can win, uh, get one or two members down, then take the Baron for free. Yeah, it is a bit of a dream dream play there, but they do need to drop the vision. And so far, it's only the bot side of the map that looks like it has a lot of vision. Bot side of the map's where all the action is, though, as Dan goes dies yet again. Crino on the TP. We'll see if he can come through with this one. Misses the flag and drag, but it is going to be Celtic going in. Not sure how confident you feel about that, because Fapto is quite strong and Daisy's on the map, but Meister Chief says, hey, it didn't work for you. Maybe it'll work for me. No, it doesn't. Sorry, double kill. And now Fapto in a crazy strong position, 6-2-9. and nine. You know, we've been singing the Corky song all game, but Callista is every bit the monster that this mid lane Terra Dearest Andy is. And now that's two threats that have to be accounted for on the side of Cornell. And we saw the really nice mechanical prowess as uh, UMass managed to dodge out the hook there. They uh, dodged out the, uh, crucially, the EQ as Callista, mm. just using that martial poise to jump out of the way. Uh, they're sieging up on multiple fronts right now. This is exactly what you need to do when you're at this level of advantage. You push mid, uh, you push bot, and you just capitalize, as we said, where there are fewer members. And uh, they managed to get two towers off the back of it as multiple members tried to collapse on Pool Party Sam and find nothing. Right, and now pings are coming down for the bear, and there's the wards you were talking about earlier. It's going to be interesting to see if they do try to hold off and get a pick in the brush, or if they're just going to start all guns blazing on this Baron. I think they want the blood beforehand because there are five members alive for Cornell. And they don't want to be collapsed on potentially Uzi Wuzi landing a big ultimate and catching right. out one of the key members. They do want to continue to bait people in. And right now, though, it's they're not falling for it, so they have to start off the Baron to at least bait them in even further. This is big. Krino's back, actually. He has to run the entirety of this time, and that Mountain Drake they, they secured earlier will help them to slay this Baron fast. The fight does break out. Thunder Bobble taking the help, but Uzi Woozy going low. It is Baron Ooh. taking away for UMass, and now the fight is going to continue as Uzi Woozy is the first casualty, but certainly not the last, as more blood will be spilled here on this map. Fapto killing spree. That's the ADC down for Cornell. Top laner as well. Krino does not get out of that one alive, and it is now only Meister Chief and Damco mid and support respectively alive to defend what is certainly going to be a devastating siege from the side of UMass. And Krino walked in all the way just to die as you were alluding to and what we got to think about what happened there is Uzi Woozy. He wanted to get into the Baron pit. He was zoned out so well by Vandervaffle only hitting Vandervaffle with the ultimate. And it meant that he couldn't what get into hook. the pit. Crucial steal uh, uh. not there and uh, that's going to be a kill onto Meister Chief as well. Nice hook as you said. The tower going down. This is going to be the inhibitor next, and the game could be closing in fairly soon, as they've got a Baron buff empowered wave taking topside as well. Yeah, they're just going to shift their focus right to the top lane, continue to find picks wherever they can. Case and point, Uzi Woozy living just by the lantern's light, but the tower does go down in the meantime. It's only two or three members that they can pull the attention away from on the side of UMass, and it continually <laughs> grinds down the side of Cornell. They are in trouble. Fapto is going crazy on the fountain steps. Nonetheless, Danco will not live to see home, and that is going to be Celtic going down as well. They're just stomping all over them. Uzi Woozy, only one left alive. No wave clear. This no hope. This is certainly the game in 22 and a half minutes. Are you kidding me? For a game that was this close up front, they're not done. They want the blood. They're going to take it away. Uzi Woozy will fall before the Nexus, and they have to just get the clean ace before they take it away. I say clean, they did lose pool party, Sam. <laughs> Laid down his life for the game. They take it away, 16-31. Favor to UMass as they come in commandingly. We saw the pressure from the mid laner, from the bot lane consistently provided by Dearest Andy and Fapto. It's just really allowed them to consistently take advantage in these team fights, come into the team fights knowing they have a stronger impact than the opponent. The only real respite for the side of Cornell was that top lane, where uh, consistently Uzi Wuzi was able to find Paul Party Sam, catch him with a couple of ultimates, and force him a bit lower. He did end up finishing the game with five and seven, which is quite mm. indicative of that. Mm. But it didn't matter in the scope of things when he was just this big bruiser front lane, and they had uh, him there with a shield on top of him from the Ivern. That was it. That was the game, simply. And he did manage to get the Arden sensor as well that we talked about a little bit. Oh yeah, which just empowered Fapdo and Dearestandi even more. I want to talk for a little bit about that Ivern's assists. 
He was 2-2 and 22, so certainly not the flashiest member of his team. But to have 24 kill participation in a 31 kill game in only 22 minutes? Yeah, over 90% kill participation. Incredible from him. He was working so hard. Even on a champion that can be considered low impact with the iPhone, because it's not really direct, it's just you pushing shields on people. It's you being mm. that support from the jungle. And uh, although he isn't the most damaging, you could see the impact he had just from that score lane. He was everywhere he needed to be. He just nailed this game. And he made all of his players look like rock stars too, right? I yeah. mean, Dearest Andy and Fafdo came out massively oh, no. that game. Um, Ivan did more damage than Tristana. <laughs> Thresh, Thresh did... Thresh did only a few hundred damage less than Tristana. Okay, sure. And, yeah, uh, Callista did six times as much damage as Tristana, almost. So perhaps this wasn't the Celtic season, huh? No, definitely Ooh. not. <laughs> okay, well, we will see if now Cornell can take this loss on the chin, keep morale high, and figure out what it was in that mid-game that started to turn those trades away from them. They do have another chance to take one back for their own home team. But we will be kicking it to a break beforehand to let them get a little rest, talk about that one, and figure out what to tweak for this next game. We'll see you here shortly. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, joining us at break here as we are halfway through now this series between Cornell and UMass. UMass taking a very convincing win in only 22 minutes in such a bloody game. We're going to see how they can adapt this time around. I am Kyle Corbis Crow, joined by Sin here today. Sin, what are your thoughts as far as the draft goes of what now UMass needs to tighten up from that last game? So what we've seen UMass do is take away the Sejuani, which we saw uh, quite a high impact on, actually, from Uzi Wuzi in the last game. And uh, now on the uh, other side, we've seen that they've dropped the Cogbore ban and replaced it with the Callista. Mm. That we saw be so prevalent for Fapdo in the previous game as well. So kind of uh, just going for the, let's ban what's strong in the previous game, but the Janna, Azir, Ezreal, and Zaya all stay up there as the highest priority of bans. Now Uzi Wuzi going for something different in the jungle. This is going to be the Rek'Sai coming through. Yeah. Definitely a strange shift in takeaway there, but we'll see what he grabs it for. Uh, do you want to touch on that Galio as well? Because that was banned coming out from the side of UMass last game. That was their first ban that Sidorni has replaced, and now they first pick it. Obviously, a lot of priority left on that for that team. And uh, obviously, as you say, highly prioritizing it because it's a flex pick between the mid and the top. And in the mid lane, it's just inherently safe. There's pretty much no matchups that can solo kill... Uh, Galio over and over again at all, and uh, now that Cogball has been lifted as a band, oh, no. that one, so this is the two bands that have been dropped. They're gonna make <laughs> them regret the fact that they've dropped this Cogball. At least that's what the plan is. Now yeah, with, they... the Lulu, with the Lulu gone, he's gonna opt for a different support. Perhaps we'll see something a little bit different, maybe even something like a Rakan. But I expect another Ardent Sensor support to go with this Cogball because he is so potent with the item, uh, already being an on-hit champion. Man, it looks like they've got their pick of the litter here. It's everything that went right for them last game. Ivern off the draw. They have those solo lane options open as well. But now with Kogma taken away for Fapto, I mean, he had such a slow start on that Callista, but by the time that Dearest Andy was able to make enough waves for him, he just came out huge. So this time around, on a champion that he can you know, take a little bit more of his fate into his own hands, I love it. A lot less of a, a lot less safety from Fat though, though, because obviously the Callista having, as we said a little bit about in the previous game, the martial poise to be able to jump backwards and kite people, provide a lot of uh, kite for herself without really needing to be peeled for, mm. and be very useful. But knowing that Cogmoy is literally going to be just trying to survive on his own right, knowing when he's against the Rek'Sai that can dive the backline efficiently, and knowing that he's against the Twitch, which has been locked in on the other side, another hyper carry AC for the late game which can bust him to pieces if he's not able to get out of the way. Absolutely correct. You touched on a potential Recon or Ardent Sensor pick before we got into this ban uh, with obviously a lot of support pressure coming out from the side of uh, Cornell here. What do you think about that Blitzcrank ban? So they just want to take it off the board because they know that it had such a large amount of pressure in the previous game. We saw that it was able to land those consistent hooks in the bot lane. And with the Callista having such a lane uh, potency already, it was amplified even more so. So without, without the Callista, it would have been a lot less strong, but just don't want to uh, have to deal with that mid-game pressure that he can have, where you have to constantly hide behind your minion wave, and it's so hard to be sieged up against when you know that it's just a firing range for Blitzcrank you. Okay. Well, we did see... Jarvan banned away now, this time in lieu of the Maokai last time around. Talia, nice strong pick for the mid lane. We'll be going over to presumably Meister Chief here. And I like it. I think with the Galio now uh, in such a strong flexing position, it opens okay. the door for uh, other picks. Cassidin, yeah, I don't want to talk about it until so, it gets locked in because yeah. they're kind of dragging it around. Oriana, yeah, much better. With the Cassio band, like we referred to in the previous draft, it leaves Talia much more comfortable in that mid lane. So what she is going to be providing is that consistent team fight DPS and uh, the ability to slow people down, be a zone controlling mage with sustained damage similar to the way that Cassiopeia works. Obviously a lot less uh, stun and kite in her kit, but other than that, it's uh, really a strong controlling pick in the mid lane. and. Uh, we do see another, what we could consider Ardent Sensor support coming through with Nami. Not the shielding supports that we normally see, this healing-based Ardent Sensor support, where she can get the bounces of the W, so you can uh, land on yourself, onto an enemy, and onto another ally. And uh, it just increases the potency of the heals, 
but also it can reset if you get it to bounce again the odd and sensor effect on your allies certainly going to be a huge impact coming out from oh. Vondervoppel if he plays oh, this no. game yeah oh yes it is going to be that Fiora coming into the top lane against Galio. I do like it so I think it, Krino was Galio, not the problem yeah. for his team last game I think Krino played his laning phase pretty damn well as best he and, could yeah and so with that in mind Fiora I think has a little bit more executing authority maybe than that Jarvan especially with a Rek'Sai coming in to gank. Sejuani, very strong ganker, but Rek'Sai, I think, just flows right into Fiora's dash in on you, knock you up, get you killed before you hit the ground sort of mentality. So I do like that pick here. I'm so just what, very what curious to see to, how Pool Party Sam does. What I want to refer to is Pool Party Sam in the top lane is going to actually be pressured out incredibly hard by this Fiora because he's, very, he's got the magic damage shield. He wants to build a lot of MR because it empowers his, his abilities. He has to build magic, uh, the armor instead of the magic resistance to deal with the Fiora. Fiora has outplay potential where she can jump in with the Q, and she can actually hover around the edge of his taunt range while still landing the Q because of the range it provides when you land near a vital. And uh, it also means that she can avoid the taunt, and also when she is going to be hit by the taunt, turn it around with the repost so she can deliberately jump right into it with the Q buffered with the W to uh, even provide more pressure in the top lane. And it just means that Pool Party Sam, he's going to have a really rough time, knowing especially that Rek'Sai is right there in the top lane to punish him, even if he tries to step past the middle point. Oh, absolutely. We had our snowballing storylines last game around. Looks to be only more so because we have the Kog'Ma for Fapdo. Uh, Dear Sandy drafting a little bit of a safer mid lane. Uh, maybe not safer, but a, a lot less of a... Snowballing mid lane champion, opting to give kind of Fapto his time in the spotlight there, does shift the story towards snowballing the Kogma for UMass. Meanwhile, on the other side, Cornell, they've got a Twitch and a Fiora, so we're going to have our pick of the litter here in terms of what champions we can see rise to absolute totality here. If it's bot lane, if it's going to be, because we do have the two scaling champions in the bot lane, lane who would you give it to here, Sin? Do you think it's going to be Fapdo coming out on top of Celtic again just because of the mechanical prowess? Or do you think with this Twitch into Kog'Ma, Celtic may be able to uh, pull off a little bit better of a game? So although Celtic had a really rough time in the previous game, with the Lulu Twitch, he has the ability to be able to... He has the tools to be able to carry these teamfights 1v9 if he gets to the late game. But what he has to worry about is the fact that he's got uh, the Orianna ult right there on top of him the moment he comes out of invisibility. And he has to play like the Mechanical God to dodge out all these abilities and be able to stay at that 1v9 ability without being chunked out instantly. And Kog'Maw, well, we talk about him, and he's it, it's similar to Talia. It's just one of these consistent, sustained DPS from a distance. And uh, it's, it's literally like the, the tales of the mid lane. It's the opposite for the ADC. So you've got the burst ADC for uh, Cornell here and the sustained damage mid laner. And on the other side, you've got the burst mid laner and the sustained damage ADC. So they both provide exactly the same thing. It's just a case of, can the big shockwave be landed before the Twitch gets the huge multi-man spray and pray? Compositionally, that's a point I actually want to touch on. We saw Cornell draft a much better team fighting comp than UMass did last game. And they still lost out in this hectic, uh, kind of extended skirmish team fight style that the game eventually devolved into there. Now. I would argue that it wasn't really necessarily about a team fight in composition. It was a composition that had team fight tools to be able to catch somebody out and get a pick. But inherently, as getting a one team fight, they seem to lack the DPS necessary with the Tristana falling off. The mid lane didn't really provide all that much with the Cassadin because he's not known as that sustained DPS. Uh, he's the a burst stage again. So when they had two very conditional damage dealers, both of which struggling to deal damage, it meant that the team fights fell apart. So this game. Uh, we're going to see if they can actually find more of a teamfight impact, knowing that they have the Talia and the Twitch Lulu combo. So the way you can go with that is thinking the fact that they don't have much of a front line to protect those primary carries. The Rek'Sai is all they have. And if you can get an Ivern catching somebody out, throwing a Daisy on top of them, or even a Shockwave coming into the back line, it could tear apart any hopes that Cornell have of winning the game. Well, with that, the point I was building up to is I actually think, yeah, that the, the team fighting composition 
as opposed to last game that UMass drafted where they were very pick focused. Now they have something with outstanding frontline potential, just getting a little bit of beef onto their Ivor and then obviously sending pool party Sam right into the middle of things as that main tank for the team with the disengage slash engage abilities from Wunderwaffel. I think this is actually a team composition that plays much better to the style that we saw come out from UMass than they had last game. So I actually think they've, definitely come away very high up in this draft if the game plays out anything like it did last time around. And uh, with, with with the support they've got for the Cogmore, they've got this kind of protect the Cogmore composition. We've got the Galio ultimate on top of him. You can get that Oriana ball to give him that much more safety, as well as the Nami and the Ivan. It's inherently based around Fapdo. With his performance in the previous game, you can understand why they'd be willing to give him that amount of resource. Oh, certainly. UMass, UMass is going to be looking to be able to uh, get him ahead early and he's actually gone for the more defensive laning setup where he's got the barrier and his support has the heal so with the uh, likely mastery being the uh, i forget the name at the moment the wind speaker's blessing <laughs> it's going to be coming out from the nami having the heal on her gives him that little bit of extra sustained little bit of extra healing should that uh, need to be used whilst also going for the barrier getting the full value of that you don't get affected by a recently healed debuff on a shield so if you're running double heal, that would be uh, it would have some negative aspects. But you get even more of a health pull with this temporary shield that's larger than a heal. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It's going to create a lot of time. You know, one second for a Kog'Maw in a fight can change the tide of everything. So giving themselves as much as possible, you know, playing that game of inches in League of Legends, a very strong way to put it. I think you've touched on an excellent point there. Talk to me about these junglers, though, because now we know that both bot lanes can snowball. We expect that to be the focus, but we can't leave topside out of this. We can't count out any lane. What do you think Uzi Woozy particularly needs to do here in terms of his jungle pathing to get Celtic really going? Well, he's got the optimal start knowing that uh, Meister Chief used the Q onto the Raptors to give him that extra clear speed. But it looks like instead of going towards the top lane that I would have been expecting to try and get the Fiora rolling ahead of the Galio, where she could become a side lane focus and uh, win the game for them that way, instead he's actually just going for the full clear. And I would have much preferred him to actually pressure out full party Sam early on, knowing that the Galio doesn't really have that many escape tools. Ooh, little bit of a skirmish coming out in this bot lane. Both AD bars, low Danko flashes in. But can't find it now Vunderwaffle's on the retreat but fuse enemy is here i don't think this is going to turn into anything i'm pretty sure the best option for all of them is to back off there's probably so many nerves right around this bot side lane that no one wants to be the first one to give it away and both three summoners on both sides both mm. junglers showing up to the fight yeah absolutely to yeah. stop that one from uh, going any worse as Vunderwaffle had to back off knowing that the Rek'Sai was close, and of course Rek'Sai backed off, knowing that Fuzz uh, enemy was close as well. So it's just going to be a 0 for 0 trade with the three summoners instead. And uh, now Ivan's happy because he gets to walk all the way back up through his jungle and pick up all the marked camps and get a full clear on his first clear, exactly what he wants. And it's quicker than the Rek'Sai's done so because Rek'Sai's consistently looking for these ganks. Like yeah, she is a she's stayed bottom, showing herself now. They left the vision, so it is... It had the potential, I think, to be a good turnaround, but I think she showed a little too early there. One, I can agree with you, it was a little bit too early, and two, just slowed her own tempo down massively mm. to show up there. And it's allowed Ivern, as you can see, to invade into the topside jungle and uh, check for any wards. He's spotted out that the uh, Krug camp is still up, so we could see him go there shortly. And uh, it just gives too much information to Fuzz Enemy to have really been worth it. Yeah, definitely just let him decide whatever he wanted to do. Take his time, stroll leisurely throughout this. I do want to shift gears away from the jungle, though, actually, as we do have a little bit of bot lane fights going around. It does look like these lanes oh. are starting in pretty good favor for UMass here. I mean, we just saw Pool Party Sam take a huge chunk out of Krino, which was, I don't think, what either of us were expecting to happen so early on. But... It's a really nice repost from Krino to be able to dodge the knockup from the uh, Justice Punch, and he is going to be able to survive that one out, but he has been pressured out from the Qs from the Galio. 
Galio has gone really low on mana, and will have to back and probably use his TP as well, but this yes advantage has been in favor of Prino in this early game, and that's all he really needs to do until he hits sort of level 6, level 7, where you can start looking at him being able to 1v1, go in for the all-in, and uh, a, a really interestingly here, opting for what looks like the Black Cleaver or Trinity Force first with the Phage rather than going for the Tiamat that we see from most viewers to increase her wave clear potential. And that would have really helped knowing that Galio has a lot of safe wave clear with the Q from a distance. Certainly so. I think Krino at this point is putting a timer on this lane for Pool Party Sam. He's already up almost double CS, uh, essentially double, when he finishes this wave off. And now Sam is obviously going to be calling for help, but we've not seen a whole ton from Fuse Enemy. I'm curious as to whether or not UMass is saying, hey, look, just weather the storm, stay alive, and we're going to get Fapto going here in this bot lane. It's going okay yeah. for him thus far. Or if they're going to try to divert some resources, because if you're in this position, what do you really send up? Do you try to gank with the Ivern and hope for the best? Do you roam up with Dearest Andy on Oriana, not opting for a TP mid laner this time? I mean, what are their options? You can instantly see, if you look at Cogmore's items, exactly what the plan is. He has gone for <laughs> the upgraded Relic Shield here to give yep. his support even more gold generation, of course, the support going for the coin, to get the Ardent Sensor that much quicker. Mm. And they're waiting for that Ardent Sensor, crucially, to be able to get these team fights going, to get the skirmishes going in favor of Fapdo. And although it's a rather odd choice, it's one we've seen rising up quite a lot, where these uh, scaling ADCs go for a Relic Shield early. It provides them with a lot of sustain in lane, and if they have some lane dominance anyway, it just amplifies their potency come the mid game. So talk to me about that item in particular then, because I'm curious, this is not something that I've seen too much happen with. Is that the kind of thing that he's gonna, oh, hang on, put that thought on hold, come right back to it, because Dearest Andy has to force the heal. Okay, so a little bit of mid lane pressure, good to burn the summoners there from Orianna. Actually, the fight's gonna continue on ever so briefly. Trades just going back and forth as Celtic taken low, and we should reset to normal here, barring any ganks. I want to go back to that item. I want to ask you a question. Is that the kind of thing, is that something you're looking to sell after your first item, or are you just going to build it up and then sell it at the very end once you've maxed it for the shield? I mean, where does that relic shield play later into the game for this Kog'Maw? You basically sell it once you get to the point in the game where uh, you aren't in the laning phase consistently anymore. But now we see the fight coming through in bot lane. I'm going to hold that for Yeah, Bapto taking away first oh. blood. Nice. Chunk of health eaten at the back line there. And Kog'Maw passive will not be enough to net them a return kill. So clean play from Cornell to take away the first blood. Very well done. And now possibly opening the door to a dragon if they can get this vision down right. Having a much easier early game than the previous one, as we see... I am Celtic actually winning out in the laning phase because of the Arden Sensor choice where they're going so aggressively defensive, if you will, to make sure that the Wonder Waffle gets this one early on. It means that they've conceded a lot of their pressure they would have had because Cogmore doesn't get the Blade of the Rune King that much earlier. He opts for a, a much more sustaining build. And when you come to these all-in fights, that's not going to help you. It's the same as when you talked about the Doran shield in the bot lane. You could go for it and uh, just be fine taking one or two trades. But once you come to the all-in, the Doran's blade is the one that wins. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, with that nice little advantage, we do see... Uh, actually, Twitch picked up a zeal and then sold it. Uh, Celtic changed his mind about that when he started with the zeal and has now opted BF Sword instead. So playing a little bit on the fly there. Uh, I think the extra damage is going to help him in that regard in this lane, but it does tell me that I think they want to play out this laning phase just a little bit longer. No towers have gone down, it's only First Blood and a Dragon. And so that tells me, I think, that Celtic wants to stick around in this bottom lane. Do you think that gives a little bit too much power to UMass now to just say, hey, that's fine, we can snowball this Kog'Maw even further then, or just keep that CS rising? The problem that can arise if you do have that kind of mindset, though, is that Rek'Sai can continually camp bot lane and kill the Cogmore over and over again. And if that uh, Cogmore dies two or three more times, that's where the game starts to look incredibly risky. Speaking of risky. Yes, and I'm gonna put you on hold there as Pool Party Sam is trying to get in onto Kreno. Well there to... And Daisy comes down. Pool Party Sam quite low, but Tally is going so far into the back line forward. He tries to find the return kill. Uzi Woozy joins the fight. Doesn't even matter because Meister Chief had that one handled himself, but 
is going to be a nice takeaway to just tank out that daisy, make sure if he's in me, cannot pressure that one. And now suddenly some top lane pressure going well into the hands of Cornell. Bot lane, different story. Celtic has to flash out, has to heal. Crucially, no summoners now. And gets ganked by Dearest Andy. No way. Did not see that one coming. Yeah, this is bad news for Danko here. There's the shockwave taken out. There's the damage, but it is only Deer oh. to be taken to use the support heal. But I'll call that one worth for a double kill to the Orianna now. And with Fuzzinami holding the mid lane for the Orianna, it just means it's even she's even more safe to go for that tower dive. And uh, they managed to get a little bit of gold back onto the Cogmore, and this is exactly what he needed. We talked about the pressure that was being sent bot lane, and now he can feel a lot more comfortable knowing that he's just got a big chunk for himself. Uh, still a little bit behind the Twitch as of right now, but... Yeah, there's only 300 gold between the two, which yeah, actually it's... feels surprisingly small considering that Twitch also has a CS lead. But what you've got to consider into that is the fact that the Targon's Brace is slowing down any spike that Fapdo would get dramatically. So it's purely down to when Vandervoffel gets the spike, rather mm. than uh, the ADC. It's really interesting when we talk about the support power item spikes, rather than the ADCs being more important. Yeah, that's not something that uh, traditional League of Legends has led us to take stock of too often, so it is a rather new development in current meta, but not an unwelcome one at all. Because I still like that there's still so much of a job that supports have to do throughout all this, right? It's not like, oh, I get to Ardent Sensor and I win the game. They still have to be on top of all of their I's and T's in terms of keeping vision, keeping trades in line. I think vision especially yeah. in this so, game is so important because these teams both need to step up their game. We can look at how the support role has changed over time after being that just pure vision bot that will build uh, the first item Sightstone every single game to the point where they're actually building aggressive items to make the AD stronger as their first item in the game. And, uh, it's a welcome change, but back in the day in League, where we actually had two supports in the game, the jungler was just somebody who had very low gold generated, uh... and uh, <laughs> would end up with pretty much just being a tanky engager. That's why we saw things like the Lee Sin and the Jarvan being very strong back then. Uh, it's very interesting to see how the game has changed over time to be what it is today, and... Uh, it's going to be a very big change-up when we see these rune changes come through. How much they have to rebalance all the champions, but uh, yeah. we have to be excited for the future. That does seem to be the right game's MO, is throw a lot of stuff at the game during the offseason after Worlds, and then just kind of tweak it into the most perfect iteration of that game that uh -oh. it can be. Oh no, that's bad. Fapto's health already taken out over halfway. It is going to be taken down. Uzi Woozy does that. Daisy not going to be here in enough time. And what a stop from Master Chi. He did not mean to do that. I don't believe. Canceled the wall a little early and got a health bar chunk from it, but came out on top anyway, taking away Thunder Waffle. So Meister Chief proving he is indeed the Meister there. And now this is a bad spot. What? Ooh, did not want to play that one out. Dearest Andy did pull in the shockwave, but yeah, that seemed to be a little bit of a uh, eager yeah, beaver play that's there. That's if you right-click on the enemy <laughs> uh, and then just uh, look away from the screen for five seconds. And, uh, it did cost him his life, but now they're still trying to dive Dearest Andy. He's staying under the tower. They've got to be really careful because he could pick up a double. Oh, yeah, it is very bad. Celtic's health bar is high enough, and Danko stayed out, but now actually left the door open for Fapto. Yeah, Holy that's why you got to be careful. That's why you got to be careful. And now yeah, Danko, another mode, one here. he's got to be sped up to get there, though, and it's uh, going to be a, the slow from the Glitter Lance, keeping him off of Danko, keeping Danko safe for now. But this is such an explosive game, so back and forth, and although the Cogma is still a bit off the Rage Blade first item, as it's to be for him this game, Mm. He still has a fair amount of damage, and you got to definitely take that into account when you're trying to dive the a mid laner as the ADC gets back. And I don't think that's so much of a problem in context of his lane, right? Because if you look at the items on the other side, if you look at what Celtic's been building, he did opt for the BF Sword before the Zeal, but now he's got that Zeal. So he's right. not, you know, a first item threat either. The Zeal will be a, a huge contribution, but... 
neither of these ADs have completed their first item as the fight may yet break out again. They want it, they've got it, but Uzi Woozy has to be careful. Good ultimate tidal wave from Nami to keep things moving there. Right, on the Galio. Flank. Ooh, yeah, she has the potential there, but her team is split, and now Krino can do a lot with these stuns. Danko's trying to get in. Krino finds the first, but is diving for the second, and that barrier, what you talked about, so good there from Fapto. Krino now on the run for his life. Will not get out of that one. It's just a matter of who they want to give it to. It is Pool Party Sam. Fapto denied the kill there. They have to be careful. Good shockwave Ooh. to pull in two. Meister Chief going to be in trouble there. Pool Party Sam finds a double all at once and all of a sudden is coming out to be a triple kill. This is going to be massive. They could ace or they could just let them back off, let the bot lane breathe and grab a nice infernal Drake to That's keep their rich. snowball killing. He's oh. coming in with the invisibility. He could find an assassination if they're not careful, but he's just going to throw out that Venom cask and back off, but... You gotta look at that fight, and that it was started off so well. We saw Krino going really hard into the back lane, but the barrier was turnaround. Dearest Andy coming in with the two-man shockwave to ensure that they get the lead off of that team fight. And now the gold lead that was a couple K early on has been shrunk all the way down to 400. Yeah, it's razor close here. Only a kill between them, but I think at this point the momentum's definitely going to be going back over into the hands of UMass here. They lost it for a little bit, but with that fight and that turnaround, despite the fact the kills may not have gone everywhere they wanted to, with Pool Party Sam getting a triple kill that obviously would have been much better in the pocket of Fapto, it's a huge takeaway. They've got the Infernal Drake out of that one, possibly one of the best for their composition that they could have t taken in that instance, and one of the better ones to deny, right, over to the side of Cornell. You don't want them taking it. Yeah, it's I really think the they put in their court. Court. Knowing that you've slowed down the scaling inherently of the Cogmore by going for the Targon's Brace, it's going to help you get that 8% extra damage a little bit early on, so you hit the breakpoint where Cogmore can 1v9 just that much earlier, and uh, the 8% can really show up as more effective than you see it just on paper. But uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is you said the triple kill goes over to Pool Party Sam. With the Thorn Mail completed, he's actually going to have a lot of an easier time in that lane against Krino. At least he could uh, find the mana with the Catalyst of Aeons to just throw his Q out, back off. Throw his Q out, back off consistently. And not really worry about the threat of an all-in from Krino. Mm. And it's not just Krino that that item does very well against, too, right? It is going to be a headache and a half for I Am Celtic in the later parts of this game when he has to deal with that tank line. So, very smart itemization. But what do you do with it? You have that now. I mean... If you are UMass, are you not just looking to push this now into the team fighting stage of as soon as possible? Especially when these extended runs seem to be favoring the bot side of Cornell. Well, I say that, but nice gank might get Danko in some trouble here. Has to ult himself, doesn't matter. Goes down. Fapto takes that one away. And Celtic, despite invisible, will not get out alive. Excellent heads up play. And please, Sin, would you grab me a fork so I can eat my words from earlier? Extended bot lane, definitely going over to Kog'Maw though. So, so they asked the question for there. me. The reason it's not the team fight phase yet is because all the towers were still up. There was no space to team fight. Now taking that bot lane tower is going to make it easier. But dearest Andy, yeah, he's gone. He's he's just gone. <laughs> Nothing he's, to talk he's about there. Clean kill. <laughs> nice gank from the Rek'Sai, and not really respecting the gank potential because he knows that his jungler is sitting in the bot lane. They know where your jungler is. You can't afford to push your lane aggressively because there's no chance of a counter gank. You're just going to get ganked. You're going to die 2v1. There's no 2v2. Speaking of twos, that is two towers taken away. That push netted them not just first tower, but another one at an immense level of there as... Rek'Sai wants to make up for it though as they're on Rift Herald. Yeah. I think this is their best bet if they don't get it stolen away again. Oh, my. I'm still having panic attacks about that. I mean, they just... That totally yeah. shifted the game for them. And while it definitely seems that UMass has a much better grip on this game at the Rip Herald portion, whew, um, I do think that is a very nice takeaway for Cornell here. It's just a matter of what they're going to do with it because a shockwave onto Uzi Woozy take a front line, their only front line is going to be a great start to play this fight out. I think they might want to dive the tower here, but they do have to at least clear out this minion wave beforehand. And now we're getting into a point in the game where they can just set up a battering ram and run down these towers. 
Ooh. So the problem with having Rift Herald right now is the fact that the person with the Rift Herald has just died, been taken off the map, and you can't then make a reactive play for the mid lane tower going down to try and maybe get a tower in bot side or top side to reactively respond and try and make an even trade. You just have to sit there and take it. And although Krino can try and get a bit of chip damage on this top lane, he can't get that standing gold into his pocket. So there's a 3k advantage in gold now for UMass, and they've managed to turn this game from being down that much. And uh, this is looking like a very nice display from them of what can happen when you just play for the scaling, and you do it effectively. You disengage from fights, and you only fight when you know you have a chance of winning. I definitely agree, and they played to their strong parts of the map, right? They knew Pool Party Sam, once he got that Thornmail, would be okay, wouldn't be bleeding as much against Krino, and then that allowed them to just send Fuse Enemy down into the bottom lane, get a massive double kill to turn the yeah. whole pace of this and flip the game right on its head. And now with another Infernal Drake a minute away, Baron live on the map, they have so many options. What do they go for here even? Do they just stay in mid lane pressuring this tower out? Do they have to pull off and try to fight around this Baron? Is it, you know, what are their options? So what they've got right here is the ability to just can roam around the map with this Cogmore, knowing that he's getting close to that Runin's Hurricane, and he'll have a very decent amount of wave clear. So, oh, they've actually looked to start a Baron right now. Yeah, they want it. It's not a secret going over to the side of Cornell. They're very well aware of this with the wards in the pit. The Talia wall gonna divide them so masterfully. And they're just letting Baron do the work for him. They're keeping the health bars in danger territory. Baron has reset now. This is a dangerous position, but Meister Chief taking a lot of damage. Danko as well. Fafno on the rampage. Celtic is caught out. Blast cone to get him out of that one should do the trick. No, dearest Anthe forces the flash with one of his own, but that's going to be huge. Is going to finally be Celtic oh. getting taken away there. Fafno on the flank. Yeah, he's behind the tower. They do still have the tower to worry about. Three members, but I don't think they're concerned. Look at him. Unstoppable is the only word you can use to describe that. Crino, next one down. Here's Dandy finds the credit for that. And Pool Party Sam taken away, but Meister Chief not going to live to see that one through. Only the top laner dies for five kills across what looked to be a really good start for Cornell there. And, and this with, is with the shields barren. and the heals, they can now look towards Baron, yeah. And that health bars don't matter so much. And now the, the Arden sensors on Kogbo, look how much he heals right now. This is insane. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he's just tearing right through this. This is Baron taking over for three out of the uh, four out of the five members. I'm sorry. Actually, oh, whoa. Three. <laughs> close to stealing right. it with the glitter lance there, but does Very find close. the kill onto Vanderwaffle. Uh, that's going to be a chunk of gold for him, but that is all it is in removing the Baron buff from that one member. But it's the support, and the support isn't going to be somebody you're having in a solo lane holding the Baron buff. So it doesn't really get them much more than a little bit of gold. I right. think overall, UMass has to be incredibly happy with what happened at the back of that top lane die. Oh, certainly, yeah, that was perfect oh, for them. Oh, he cancels it! No, no, no he got oh, it off. It's the root. Only barely, it's the it was root. so close. So the root close. doesn't interrupt the channel, so he's fine. Okay. Oh my. Infernal Drake looks to be the next place they might want to fight around this one. A shot. The Lulu and buys him a little time to just shred down this dragon. Fapto, happy as a clam to just kill this Infernal Drake, deal damage on the side wherever he can. What a flanking tidal oh. wave! And that's going to be destruction coming out. Look at this. Krino's in the top lane with the tower, just trying to pushed down he has teleport but his entire team got wiped and the infernal drake went over so that is horrible for the side of cornell now and the flanking oh. support is the deadliest as umass finds a huge team fight this is going to net them the mid, mid lane tower they've got baron they can look towards the inhibitor tower and potentially break the base at 24 minutes into the game thunder Vopel. bit of an eager beaver there but does call in the teleport still puts himself in a lot of danger does force the teleport from Pool Party Sam, whereas I think actually they could have just sent the teleport in and left Vanderwaffle with the rest of his team. So a little bit of a misfire there, but who cares when you're grabbing Baron well, off the it, map to take away an inhibitor? Fiora. It forced Fiora off of the tower for two to three seconds, and with the amount of damage she has at this point in the game, that could have been enough to get it very close to falling. It's a very yeah. fair point. It's so t sending the support there was just an insurance, pretty much. Okay, yeah. They didn't get where they were in this game by 
throwing away unnecessary risks. I'll say that. So that's keen observation I mean, there. But unnecessary now... risks. We have to refer to the Targon's race a little bit. Oh my! Yeah, no, certainly he he but definitely decided to play for the later game. And I say two later. Half K games. above right now. Yeah. He still managed to get the gold advantage back over I am a Celtic, and. Uh, Finds the big advantage regardless of what happened in those earliest. Ooh, not the best position for Fapto to be in, but does oh, call. Here comes Galio. Enforcements. Yeah, this is bad for Uzi Woozy now. Meister G late to the health bars are low, but oh. Fapto's godlike. That's two he's found. Oh. A double kill, triple kill, as he's just shredding through them. He will not be denied. Does go down finally to the play there from Meister Chief, but Meister Chief himself is no longer for this world as the ace continues to follow through. And it seems to be the classic story. Uh, the ADC's gotten to such a hard point that you just have to kill him. But in doing so, they left themselves vulnerable for the rest of the team. But Corvus, that was a 5v4. Dearest Andy was still in base during that fight. He still, oh. They still managed to find the fight. They still managed to get Fapdo with the huge advantage. Get the uh, triple kill. And even though he falls down, it doesn't matter because this could be the game. Oh, it absolutely is the game. There is no way Celtic... As the Nexus does go down 26 minutes. Took them four minutes longer than last time, but it was <laughs> ever so more convincing. The gold lead 10K in a horrifying victory coming out from UMass. They took their opponents apart. What a game, Sin. And this time around, they didn't have the massive advantages from the uh, mid lane and the bot lane to be able to pull off this win. Instead, it was a case of uh, losing the early game, conceding the early game, and uh, relying on the later game scaling. It works out for them, as the Kog'Maw found a massive advantage come the later stages. But basically, they had no early game with this composition. They had to purely rely on that those later parts. And uh, still managed to pull out a win this convincing? Mm. It's definitely impressive. It's definitely a statement going forward. Certainly. I think you're shaking in your boots at this point if you know you have UMass on your docket. If you're a team looking at this, saying, okay, I've got these guys to fight next, how do you prepare? What do you do? Because you know now that they have so many threats between Fapto and Dearest Andy, and even Pool Party Sam, if he gets what he needs in that top lane. If you're trying to go into a clean open, I mean, are these guys not just horrifying? I think one of the ways you can counter this style where they've gone for this later game scaling is by going for an aggressive early game jungle of the likes of Elise or Lady Sin. You can try and get an advantage on one or two lanes and snowball. We saw they didn't put any pressure on the Galio the entire game. And Fiora managed to find a couple of 1v1 close to kills. But that was pretty much it. You need to be able to go further into the top lane and uh, try and take down that Galio. Try and get Fiora to the point where they need to send two or three people to deal with her in a side lane. Then you can find advantages on the other side of the map. You know there's less members. And it's that, uh, that member advantage where you can get maybe a 4v3 instead of a 4v4 is why you pick a split pusher. Absolutely. Well, with those closing thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, to reiterate, I Pro joined here at the death by Stuart and McLeod here. Excellent McLeod, cast on the McLeod. McLeod, I am so sorry. It's my uh, American illiterance. Um, <laughs> we are going to have some more games for you to watch here today as Opal and Brian Starkey will be coming in to cast and again in about 30 minutes here, and that match is going to be LSU versus Texas A&M. We hope you'll stick around for that, but in the meantime, we will be bidding you adieu from the day. Going to kick it over to the rest of the stream. Thank you for joining us.
tell you a story about me and you Out on the water, surrounded by the blue They scream that only I'll be saved They told us not the line, but I just let it float away Yeah, I let it float away I let it float away I let it float away, float away, float away Yeah, I let it float away And welcome everybody to AVGL's coverage of their Collegiate League of Legends Championship. I'm Alexander OPL Archambo. Joining me for the cast all the way down, down in Atlanta is Brian Starkey. Brian, how are you doing today? Doing excellent. Really excited for these games that we have coming up. The series right before this was kind of a, a crazy one too. Kills a minute. Yeah, it was back and forth, but you know what? UMass was able to secure those victories, but we're not here to talk about UMass. Right now, we have LSU taking on Texas A&M, and this is actually a rather important matchup for both teams because winner here, pretty much for Texas in particular, solidifies their spot as second place in this division and moves on to the bracket. Yeah, that's uh, that's going to be really huge. Uh, like you said, this game is really, really important, and actually, on that note, let's go ahead and jump right into the picks and bands because... They already have five of the six bands out for this first round, and I kind of want to talk about a couple of them real fast because a couple of them are champions that we've actually seen in previous uh, AVGL games over this past couple of days, and they have been kind of big power picks. Uh, I'd like to start out with the Janna and the Cho'Gath being uh, banned away in that first round. Those are both really big. We, we saw Cho'Gath uh, be played extremely well on, I believe it was uh, Friday night, that was a really strong game, as well as Janna very, being very popular as a pick right now because of how strong Ardent Sensor is. 
Um, so all champions that use art and sensor right now are, are very high prioritized, especially ones like Janu who have that strong disengage and engage potential depending on how they choose to play her. Especially, even saw last game how much of an emphasis is on Arden Sensor when you have an ADC starting Relic Shield just to funnel more gold onto that support. Other bands we see coming through was a Kane by LSU. Kane was actually, I believe, played yesterday to great effect in one of the series. Actually, one of the games I believe it carried pretty hard. It was around 8, 3, and 6. It was an absolutely disgusting score. We're already out of bands, though. They're already starting picks. And for Texas, they got pretty much the strongest duo lane and bot at the moment. That's the Zaya and the Rakan. Yeah, Zaya and Rakan are so dominant. I feel like Rakan by himself, like you could pick Rakan without Zaya and still be really good, but Zaya is an okay pick in my opinion by herself. But when you add Rakan in there, like you said, it becomes the absolute strongest bot lane in the game because for a lot of reasons, you can run that Arden sensor on Rakan if you choose to. And then Zaya is just so good with her W, being able to proc with, uh, proc with Rakan to allow him to basically get those long range auto attacks and help basically stack up that damage and, and put them at a good position to kind of bully their lane a little bit. Now, on to the other side here for LSU. We're starting to get some of their picks. Gragas being picked up. That was a pretty unpopular pick at the moment in this tournament. I'm almost seeing it picked or banned on almost every series I've casted, as well as now a Twitch. Sam L for one of the teams yesterday oh, used that to great effect. So actually yellow. carried one of the games back when they were losing. And oddly enough, Starlord has locked in the Sona. We don't know if that's going to be a support or a mid laner. I likely see it going support, though. Yeah, I would see it going support as well. I've seen a couple of mid lane Sonas. Uh, just in in some solo queue games, but you know solo queue is one of those things where you can kind of expect anything, and that's what you'll get. Uh, I like you said, I would be surprised if that Sona does end up in the mid lane, especially as a blind pick into that. Uh, you don't really see that that often. The Syndra actually being banned away to quickly change notes there. That's a that's actually a really smart ban. Uh, Syndra is a very strong uh, control push your lane and then roam to go do something else, and I think that's a that's a smart ban to take away, especially if you don't want to have to deal with that pressure on the map. Especially, it's a great, I find, blind pick into a lot of matchups. As long as if you are in a losing matchup, usually you can just play no, safe, wait for fools. your jungler to come on by to provide a gank, and then instantly that level six, you literally get the kill button in that unleashed power just to delete your opponents. We're starting yep. to see the final groups of bans. They don't want to see that Yasuo or that Kled on the side of LSU. And also that Jarvan, a rather popular pick yesterday, was able to go very deep into the back line. It looks like it's going to be a victor being picked up here for Texas. Yeah, Victor is a really strong pick still. I feel like Victor, there are times where he'll be really strong, like just be super busted in the meta. And then all the times that he's like not super busted, he's still going to be strong, right? Because he provides a lot of safety. He has a lot of good crowd control. He does have some very strong burst potential coming out with his ultimate. So he does have a lot of uses, especially if you're just trying to pick that safe lane and you're not really sure what you're going to get. And in that top lane, and looks like we're going to have that Nautilus for uh, BB Warden out there. Yeah, haven't seen a Nautilus for a very long time. Was quite popular in the beginning of the season. And it looks like they're going to follow that up with a very nice control mage with a lot of AoE and that beautiful uh, CC ultimate in the Shockwave command with that Orianna. Yeah, that Orianna pickup, I, I'm i always a fan of an Orianna pickup in a Nautilus or a Gragas team comp. I mean, even even with Twitch, if you've got... If you're really bold, you could you could do some sweet plays with the ball delivery system with Twitch there on that ADC and his stealth. Uh, but really with Gragas and Nautilus, you set yourself up for some really, really awesome ball delivery systems or even just some initial combo startup, honestly. Like using the uh, using the Nautilus uh, death charge to get into the middle of enemy team, knock the tank up, throw the ball behind them, and then basically use your command shockwave that way. There's a lot of sweet combos that you can do there. And then actually an interesting pickup is that Sejuani in the jungle for the side of, uh, of Texas A&M. That's pretty cool as well. I actually really like that pickup. Yeah, Sejuani has been very popular ever since her mini rework around the mid-season mark with all the tanks. And we've seen it a little bit actually at World's Play-Ins. I believe Contracts was playing that last night in a couple of matchups. And it's done very well. It provides a lot of very easy CC to land. That ultimate is quite hard to miss, in my opinion. If you end up missing that one, then, you, of course, you get the X-Smithy memes. But it provides <laughs> a lot of 
up right when you hit that level six, and especially on someone like an Oriana or a Twitch that if you catch them out, they don't really have any built-in escapes. They only got yeah. those summoners to get them out. Now, we mentioned that Nautilus. The only thing I don't like about this Nautilus is the target that he's going to be wanting to go for is the ADC with that depth charge. But mm -hmm. you have a Zaya that can just Featherstorm during the animation and cancel out that ultimate while applying damage of her own. Yeah, I think the interesting thing about that is while you can use the depth charge to try to get on Zaya, who can use her ultimate to get out of it, it still provides a juicy target for Oriana to maybe use that as a distraction to throw the ball in, command shockwave that Victor, or even pull out the Rakan early on, because Rakan actually does take some time to scale and to kind of get those stats that we we like to see him have for that survivability towards that mid to late game. It does take him some time to get there, and so early on, I think that's a good target for him to try to go for. I would definitely try to avoid that Sichuani and Maokai for obvious reasons, though. Yeah, and with the Rakan too, if he's able to get to that point where he is able to survive and just dash into the opponent's charm a couple of those carries, it can be devastating here with this combo. You have a Victor that can lay down a beautiful amount of AoE damage on top of, say, a Twitch and Orianna. Very squishy champions, and Orianna going to have to get Azonias at some point a bit later on, probably around the second or third item. If she doesn't want to fall behind too far, Is uh, there's a lot of potential ability for some explosive mid-game fights. Yeah, I think that we have been talking a lot about what LSU can do into this Texas team, but I think, honestly, Texas A&M, they have a lot of potential to really push back onto, onto LSU, though. There's three really solid targets that you can go for for pretty much any of your damage, right? You take out that Sona early on in the fight, like get her before she can put her ult or force her to ult too soon, where it just doesn't do a lot for her team, and she's really squishy. She takes, she takes a long time to even get some decent resistance where she doesn't just get instantly annihilated. Uh, you know, Twitch is a really good one to go for and that Oriana. So I think that Texas A&M, they have the tools to go for that with the Maokai and the Sejuani to lock targets up just long enough for Victor and Zaya to do the damage that they need to. And then with some extra peel from Rakan to keep that Gragas and the Nautilus off of them in the back line, I think the damage is there for Texas A&M to actually really turn around fights, even if they kind of get a bad start, if Sejuani and Maokai are able to get into that position quick enough by using their ultimates and some of their just their kit CC. Yeah, they have a lot of great re-engage potential. If that Gragas barrel doesn't hit out a target and instantly kill somebody, if there's a shockwave that's missed, or Nautilus Death Charge that isn't used quite effectively, ends up only knocking up a tank, you can instantly see that Maokai turning down the roots and putting that down the lane. And it's quite hard to escape that, especially in confined spaces around the jungle, where I feel like we're going to see a lot of fights, because when you're that Twitch or that Oriana, you like close quarter combat in those tight spaces where you can land a lot of ultimate damage with the Spray and pay Prey, or the shockwave, so it's kind of a uh, kind of a, a double-edged sword there, in the sense that if you're not able to land those ultimates for that re-engage, you are going to be engaged upon. It can be devastating. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be really tricky for LSU. I feel like they're gonna have to be, like you said, they need to be really smart about where they choose to pick these fights. Because while they can use the Oriana to group up all of the enemies that they get with that command shockwave and have Twitch lay down that damage, I feel like if they're not careful or if Twitch doesn't get going, uh, that that Twitch pick is actually going to possibly become a liability just because with the amount of CC that uh, that Texas A&M has on their side to be able to use into that combination, I feel like. Well, it looks like we're getting out of our spectator delay, so I'm excited to see how this one is going to pan out, guys. Remember, it is Louisiana State University taking on Texas A&M on the red side. Make sure to leave your thoughts in the chat, as well as let us know on Twitter. We're always engaged on that. Let us know who you think is going to take this one home. This is a pretty big matchup. If Texas can 2-0 this, they're pretty much guaranteed into our knockout stage. And that, and I wonder if that's going to affect... Texas A&M like it affect their play style at all right where they kind of feel this like this mass amount of pressure where they, like we have to 2-0 these guys if we want to get this guaranteed spot but it also depends because Texas A&M at least I know their their A team has a lot of experience just through the uh, like riot collegiate series of mm -hmm. being very clutch and very strong and so I wonder if it, it kind of passes down onto their not necessarily their A team but maybe their B team. Well, you know, if you got that infrastructure that's able to produce good talent and able to nurture these players, you should be able to produce a lot of solid rosters. And in their group, they have shown up so far going 6-2, and two, only dropping one game. I believe that was to the leaders of the bracket being Georgia State. Yeah, uh, that is very... Uh... Man, that, that's big. I, I think that's the reason that's big is because you always see these kind of power struggles, even in your normal collegiate... Uh, storylines with uh i think it is it i think georgia tech is in first right 
Um, I believe maybe I got that wrong. You're going to have to give me one moment here as I'm just seeing the bracket yet again. Sorry, it wasn't Georgia State. It was Georgia Tech. That was my uh, misunderstanding there. No, no, that's uh, that actually is a good clear because, yeah, that is that is actually a normal big storyline anyway for like the basic collegiate series is this Georgia Tech into Texas A&M. Both of these teams or both of those teams uh, constantly butting heads in terms of making it to playoffs. And then once they're in playoffs, always kind of competing with each other very heavily. And so I think that's a uh, that would be a fun storyline to follow through the rest of this tournament after this game. Well, we'll have to see that is we're still on the loading screen, guys. We're still seeing what's happening here. Someone must have taken a little extra long to get into the game. Is student life, after all, I can understand. I know a lot of actual high-tier players that still play on some old MacBook, 2012 MacBook. So um, <laughs> it's a little... I, I don't know how he's able to play on that. We're still waiting on this one. But uh, Starkey, just give me some background. What kind of roles do you main? Uh, so for me, I actually really enjoy playing. Uh, I actually really enjoy playing support and uh, ADC. There was a time where I thought I could be good at top lane, but that was also when it was like top is an island, and you don't really play top lane to have fun. You play top lane because your team needs somebody to be there. Uh, and so I moved away from that top lane kind of structure and stayed in that bot lane uh, where I felt the most comfortable. How about yourself? Oh, well, I'm on. an ADC main myself, though I do like to fill in. Right away, you can see the aggression from Texas. They know they have a great invade if they're able to stun up any member with that Sejuani. Looks like they just wanted to get some ward coverage down on that red buff, get some information on where Beast might be starting. Yeah, that actually is going to be really big because that can help dictate what uh, Pathernax decides to do on this Sejuani. If he does... Uh, if he can actually follow his path after what he does on the red, it could either allow uh, Pathernex to either try to do some counter jungling or to basically counter gank or to uh, gank the lane that they know that Gragas is not going to be at. Sorry, I keep losing my chain of thought because of this <laughs> thing that's happening here in on our screens. Um, <laughs> I... Uh... I, I don't know. The bird action on screen. Please turn away your uh, child's eyes right there. We don't <laughs> understand they are the lovers duo bot lane, but that is just not appropriate for League of Legends. If if, if Graves couldn't have a cigar, I don't think we can have uh, bird baiting calls on screen. I think that's just weird. <laughs> has, has science gone too far? Has, has League gone has, too far? Has Rito gone too far? <laughs> but we get to see where these junglers are going to be starting up. And that's a big thing in the meta, it's, or in G League of Legends in general, ever since around Season 4, where jungle was able to make such a huge impact in lanes. Yeah, I, and I think that's always going to be kind of that same storyline of what does your starting vision look like, and then what does your like early to mid-game vision look like? Because we've seen League more or less shift to that very early to mid game control getting these objectives especially with first turret blood and these new and the new elemental drakes and now with the addition of uh the new rift herald and the way that works these the game is constantly shifting kind of more towards that early game and it does look like there's gonna be a small scuffle in the bot lane yeah you got that recon already jumping on in they got that level two quite early ahead of their opponents and Wanted to try and make something happen. Actually walk away, I think, worse for wear in that trade, but should be able to just reach in up. They got a couple pots on there. Yeah, that was a little bit hard for uh, Murder is the Word just because he did miss his uh, his level 2 knockup with Rakan, and so he did not have any CC, so he just sat there and, and ate all of that Sona and Twitch damage to the face without being able to really fight through any of it because all he had was his dash after that. You know, you just mentioned murder is the word. I would have been so happy if his name was Bird is the word, and they're playing this bot lane duo. But <laughs> I got it. It was a little. It was close. I was like, oh, it's almost there. It's almost perfect. But we'll have to see how they play out this lane. Meanwhile, up in top side, Beast has roamed on over with this Gragas. They're able to interrupt Andrew as he's trying to knock them back. Beast finally uses the body slam. Andrew might be able to get away with this one. You don't have a lot of damage. They might continue on in. Beast takes a lot of damage here. Here comes Panthrax on that Sejuani. He forces the flash out from Beast. Gets that stun onto the Nautilus. They want to keep on going. Andrew might have went just a little too far. He has to flash out. Beast goes on in. Flash from the Nautilus. That's first blood going over to Nautilus. Panthrax answers with a kill of his own. Now it's the battle of the tanks. Sejuani first on Nautilus. Looks like they both say, you know what? You know what? We both killed each other's friends. We, we're good. We're cool. We're cool. 
Yeah, that was actually a really, really good gank by HD Beast there. Initially, he was able to land down that cask and actually get the slowdown. Andrew tried to time it so that when he used his twisted advance, he didn't get hit by the slow CC, but he actually still did. And that allowed uh, BB Wardena to actually get a very easy undertow and basically follow it from there. And then with Pathernax rotating up and then getting the knockup, it was a good re-engage, but like you said, Andrew was in too deep. And I think he stayed a little too long with the amount of low health that he had during that fight. Well, either way, they're going to trade up in top side. Though the gold going to go onto that, and also going to get be able to get that Cinder just a little bit earlier in that matchup, able to push the wave, at least match a Malkai. I feel like Malkai has pretty good wave push, but down in bot side, looks like Nat Kitty's going down super low, has the stealth to run away, teleport coming in from the Nautilus up on top side. Maybe not one they wanted to go on in, doing decent damage to Captain. There's an exhaust use onto the Twitch. Captain has to flash away. Murder is the word. Still very healthy in this point. And I'm not too sure about that teleport. I don't think it was needed. Yeah, I actually don't agree with that teleport at all. But at the same time, it doesn't make that big of a difference because Andrew did use his teleport to get back up into that top lane. So they almost have identical teleport timers there for both BB Warna and Andrew. Uh, so there's not going to be any large advantage one off of that, except for that Captain Bright did have to use both of his summoners, and Murder is the Word had to use his exhaust. So those are actually some very big summoners burned into the bot lane, at least until Zaya hits level 6 here in the next 4 minutes or so. Yeah, really the only thing that was lost there for Wardna on that Nautilus is a little bit of CS. It's going to crash into the turret, so at least Maokai Andrew is able to adjust that gold that gets it a little bit closer after that first blood up in top side so he's now able to match his own with the cinder and should be able to just counter push just fine yeah they should be almost exactly equal now actually with the uh, the cs difference compared to the first blood uh the interesting thing is that uh, andrew actually did decide to go back and match uh Wardna's items picking up that cinder hulk as well as uh getting a couple of potions for some extra sustain there against that nautilus just because he's so tanky and he he can just do so much damage early if you're not paying attention that you need to make sure that you're able to survive through some of that extra poke that can come down because you know hd beast he did have a very early gank top there and so i think playing that a little bit safer is the right choice because you don't want to speed up the timer on nautilus just being ginormous and trying to fight through that now, I like what Texas has done with their ward coverage in the river. They've already set up two control wards in around that Infernal Drake well up in topside. Andrew them are just, you know, touching, a, just hitting each other back and forth. It's a tree versus submarine. It's not going to be too exciting, but Texas has established this vision down around the dragon. And if they're able to get a nice gank here in the bot side, they might try and go for that. Speaking of the devil, the root is going to come back onto this. Oh, no. You never walk alone going down very low. Sichuani decides... He wants to go for that Sona. Kitty is able just to walk away. Texas almost getting the perfect gank off there if they were able to accomplish it. Meanwhile, up in topside, Beast going on in, uses that barrel to try and interrupt here. There's going to be that depth charge we're talking about. Andrew, though, can just turn around and root them back up and just disengages right away. So that was a, a lot of action at one time. We actually do see uh, ganks on opposite sides of the map. I think the gank in the bot lane was, in my opinion, I would say definitely more worth and more effective than what happened in top lane because there was uh, more summoners burned and bot and the one in top lane actually didn't really get them anything except for wasting some time and maybe designing some CS away from Andrew. But like we were talking about earlier, he does have those two pots and so he can just kind of sit in that lane and play a little bit safer and still stay around and get some CS. And so the, the big payoff is actually there, I think, for the side of Texas A&M. Yeah, and like we said, if they were able to kill one member there, they would have saw Beast up in the top side and might as well instantly turned onto that Infernal Drake. Could have got a lot more there. Luckily, they had the summoners in that bot side for LSU. They were able to escape, so they won't be losing too much. Starlord taking a little bit of damage here. Should be able just to walk away with the Dissidence Command. But still, pretty close game here at the start. Lots of actions. Junglers making impacts where they can. Yeah, even so, with that one vision ward being taken away there at that river entrance, like, Texas A&M has such strong ward control over that Infernal Drake, which is so oh, big for them, but here's Rakan. Murder is the word. It's the Feather Storm that's going to do the damage. Murder picks up the kill, but here comes Beast for a counter. The charm is coming out from the Rakan. Captain has no escapes left. He will get taken down by the Gragas. Is able to at least answer for one of the kills. 
But still, getting some more gold onto the Zaya, as well as a small CS advantage, still doing pretty good here for Texas. That actually was such a good timed gank by HD Beast, aside from the fact that he was able to come in and make an impact and he was already rotating down, Ooh. it was... Oh, the... A little, a little <sighs> close. That's gotta yeah. hurt. That's gotta hurt. Like I said, it's it, it, feel, it feels really bad when you miss a Sejuani ultimate. It feels even worse when Beast makes an appearance. The Shockwave is going to catch out Panther Nax. He gets blasted back by the Explosive Barrel. HD Beast has really nowhere to go. There's the Victor that's gonna use that ghost to try. Beast really wants to try and secure the kill, and he's just walking circles around this terrain. He's gonna get out. Man, that's the, that's the power of level one boots, man. When you're the only person that has shoes, you can sure walk faster than everyone else, man. <laughs> Able to just uh, show off his fashion and look, uh, make it work very well. So he's able to run around there, even with the ghost being popped there by Kreisha. So a little bit of a wasted summoner spell, perhaps. He still has a pretty dominating CS lead in mid lane. Yeah, that, that CS lead is actually huge, right? That's about 700-ish gold worth of CS lead. And that that's so big right now at this point in the game where Oriana, the only thing she has is that Doran's and the, I believe that's, is that a Codex? I actually don't remember the name of that item. Um, that's the Lost Chapter. Yeah. She has the, all she has is that Lost Chapter. So she she's really just sitting on some extra ability power and, and maybe a little bit more mana. She doesn't have a lot going for her. Where this Victor, he already has his perfected Hex Core and that Doran. So he... He actually is sitting in a really good spot as he continues to level up. That perfect hex core is going to slowly become to be more and more worth as this game goes on, and he starts to get those AP items. Yeah, you know what? CS is starting to be the main factor here as far as this gold lead goes for Texas. They have a decent-sized gold lead also in the bot lane, as well as the assist goal there, even on that front. But still, CS can be a big factor here, especially early in the game when you're falling behind this fast. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at 28 CS differential in the bot lane, and they, they have the same assist score. So, I mean, giving Captain Bright that much gold early on is only going to accelerate his, uh, I guess, his transition into this early Essence Reaver, and then being able to basically spam those spells, throw out your Qs, throw out your Ws, which make Rakan even stronger, like we talked about in the draft, and then being able to call your Feathers back and get those roots down. All of that will lead to being a very strong mid-game teamfight for the side of Texas a &M. Andrew gonna dive underneath the tower. The shield's coming out from the loss. Both of them flashing away. Tried to go a little too aggressive, even with that sliver amount of health. Warda is able to get that shield with the Keystone passive as well as the shield from Nautilus himself. So able to survive that dive. And that's actually what I was talking about, right? Like Nautilus will eventually get strong and become really hard to kill. But as before that even, like you have to deal with all of these shields that he has. He's got the Keystone Mastery shield and he also has his shield. I believe it's on his W where his shield comes out as well. And that just becomes so strong and so oppressive that it's just, it's so hard to play against that after a certain point in the game. Well, you see Panthernax has come on down to this bot side, use the explosive code, and they're gonna land it right onto Sona. She gets chain CC, she gets taken down. Kitty, the next target underneath the tower. He's gonna flash on out with that feather storm coming out, rips back the feathers. Captain Bright picks up the kill. Beast now getting dived underneath his bot lane tower. Panthrax coming over to the side. Here's the shockwave possibly for the Oriana. She now needs to get away from these members, possibly a dive coming on through, they land. That says Wadi. Shockwave lands, but Andrew is taking the tower. Luckily, Cretius was not, and they're able to back off. Beautiful dive here on the bot side. That was such a huge play. Like, that was such good coordination by Texas A&M. That was a, so good. Getting all of their members there at the same time, juggling the, uh, juggling the tower aggro all the way up until Captain Bright actually ended up picking that oh, up, unfortunately. Captain. He should oh. get it. He should get it. Yeah. Little, little close, little close. Got a little concern there. Nah, you um, just gotta, gotta keep it spicy. Gotta, gotta keep it spicy, gotta keep it interesting for the viewers and the casters alike. So they're able to pick up that first tower. Now, I always wonder this, because I, I play a lot of ADC. I'm not mainly a support anymore. I used to be back in about Season 4. I'm kind of interested when it comes to upgrading this gold item versus getting an item for that Ardent Sensor. What do you feel like pays off a bit more? Uh, I think that upgrading the gold item is 
better. Uh, but that's also because I feel like it it adds a little something extra to that bot lane with the upgraded version. You get that extra gold and you also get a little bit of your extra mana. And it uh, allows champions to move towards you much quicker once you complete that quest. So I feel like the Nomad's Medallion at upgraded feels really, really good. Uh, unless you're Sona, in which I would say definitely prioritize that Ardent Sensor, but on Rakan, upgrade that gold item. All right, so both of them deciding to upgrade their gold item, get a little bit more gold income into their pocket. Never walk alone. He is walking alone in his jungle. Luckily, he's going to be able to just get out of there. Murder decided not to pull the trigger on any other abilities. And now we're starting to see some very spikes in power here, especially this Victor finished off the perfect hex core. And now you also have that Essence Reaver you're talking about for the Zion. Yeah, and the one thing that I actually didn't talk about with this Zaya Rakan combo is the extra shield dash range that uh, Rakan gets with Zaya. That is, hang on, here comes a big fight, I feel like. Yeah, Shockwave is going to land as well as the Crescendo. Depth Charge going to knock up more of the team. Murder is the word running in through, but here comes Victor from the side, able to get that Death Ray to pick off the Lone Sona. Chaos Storm going on through. He gets knocked away right on top into Kitty. Here comes Captain Bright, though, on the ADC. Feather Storm comes out, rips back another one. That's a double kill for the ADC. Now looking for a little bit more. They're on focus on the Nautilus, looking to kite back. Murder's the word is going to get taken down. Double kill for Bright and a double kill here for Kreishas on the Victor. Looking for another they're only going to find four members of the five. That was such a good delayed fight coming out of Texas A&M. That was a very strong engage by LSU, but I felt like Texas A&M, like we were talking about with kind of that delay engage in those big stalls that they have with their uh, their Sejuani, as well as their Maokai, really gave them some huge success during that, that, uh, that Rift Herald fight that I don't think they would have been able to have if they were like LSU. Um, and the reason for that is, one, Captain Bright actually waited on the outskirts of that fight for a very long time. He waited until a lot of the major cooldowns uh, for the side of LSU were blown, and then he went in. We saw that delayed where he was able to throw down a ton of feathers, shred through the enemy team, and then recall those feathers and do a ton of damage, as well as throwing down that feather storm. Like, the delayed play by, by Captain Bright there made a huge difference in that fight. That feels so great when you're a Zaya, get into the middle of a fight with a lot of weak opponents. That Feather Storm does such a beautiful amount of AoE damage, especially landing those feathers, ripping it back towards you. You can just clean up, and we saw it there taking up two kills. Andrew and Ward, still, uh, they're, they're talking to each other, saying, how your day going? You know, it's a tree versus submarine. I'm going to say this probably three times today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and the, the interesting thing about the way LSU has their kills distributed is that they're all on the wrong people, right? Like, not necess not all of them, but the majority of them, right? You have three kills on Nautilus. You don't, you don't really want three kills on your Nautilus. And while one of those came on from a kill, I believe, onto Andrew, or one of the kills was on bot lane, like, your Orianna doesn't have any kills, uh, your Gragas has a kill, and your Twitch has a kill, but Twitch was a part of of part of four of the five kills that they have and only and three of them were assists and he didn't even get the full assist gold for that so slowly but surely captain bright is really starting to pull ahead and this could get kind of ridiculous because twitch isn't going to scale quite as quickly it's ridiculous is the ward fights over here beast looking for maybe a steal not going to find it with the barrel and that's a big thing here, is if you're not able to get Star-Lord any more gold, he doesn't have a lot of damage to complement that CC. The ultimate from Parathrox not going to land there, just zones about, and they decide to go in on Beast. They're fighting in a little bit of a choke point that might want to back off. Andrew has roamed on over, is going to pop the ultimate to try and cut off the rest of the team. Beast has to flash away. You never walk alone is going to come on down. Andrew flashing forward. This is a very aggressive dive, and they decide to go through with it. Looks like they should be backing off. Explosive Gats, though, says, you're not going anywhere. We're going to punish you. Beast picks up a kill underneath the tower. Now coming in through the red buff zone, that gravity field is going to stall them up and allow them to disengage. Yeah, that was pretty questionable by Andrew. I'm not sure why he decided to keep going there, and especially to use his flash, right? Like, he was standing right on top of the blast, pl uh, the blast plant, so he could have used that to help close the distance instead of using that flash. Maybe he was afraid that it would give away what he was trying to do, but like he looked very aggressive, and so that that flash re-engage didn't catch anybody from the side of LSU off guard, and it actually just ended up getting him killed and kind of taking away some advantage that I felt like Texas A&M had, had going into that. 
And that's a big thing here. You don't want to try and give back much gold early on here. You have a 5,000 gold lead. You should be able to now control the map, start opening up that advantage, start taking some objectives. If you decide to go for those dives and bot side that are quite risky, still you're a Maokai, you do have that tankiness, but you're not that tanky. Yeah, and I, I don't feel like they're quite far enough ahead to kind of take those risks either. Like, they have a very comfortable lead right now, and there's no need for them to try to do those those tier 2 turret dives right now, especially just because there's so much extra gold around the map. Like, you could still take that top tier turret, that top level 1 tier turret. They rotated to get the Rift Herald, which I agree with. I mean, there was just some extra objectives on the map that they could have prioritized instead of kind of forcing themselves to delay those by ha not having Andrew around because he did an ill-advised dive. I also like that they went ahead, picked up that drag in the water drake, because now they got another drake spawning, and that's going to be a second infernal for them if they can secure it. Dragons actually played a pretty big part in our games yesterday. We had about five or so taken each game, so I'm glad to see teams starting to prioritize when they get the good dragons, when it's a water drake or an infernal, because infernal only snowballs your lead more by adding the percentage damage to the rest of your kit. And that is actually really, uh, that is very, very big for the side of, uh, for the side of Texas A&M because getting that extra damage down onto the side of Crecius and Captain Bright, as well as giving them that extra mana region is going to cause LSU so many headaches as the game gets later. This is quite an aggressive call coming out here. The rest of the team finally is here. Explosive Casket going to interrupt everything. Zaya able to use the Feather Storm, but here comes the rest of the team. Sichuani Ultimate is going to ban on the rest of the team. Captain Bright still alive, kiting back. There's two kills, one to the Sichuani, one to the Zaya. Double kill coming out for Beast. And now Texas A&M looking to turn around this fight right on its head. Triple kill for Captain Bright. And they were able just to punish the overaggression from LSU. Yeah, look at the strength. Oh my gosh, that was some oh, huge burst coming out of Crucius. Oh and this no. This is the issue. You can't run away from Victor once he gets that Q proc on top. Yeah, finally able to get over the wall, but they turn on to Baron. They definitely should turn on to Baron, right? Like they have such a huge advantage here right now. Like they they got such a big wipe. HD Beast has such little health. There's no way that he should try to contest this. I mean, like Captain Bright is going off the handle and all he has right now are that Zerker's Grease and that finished Essence Reaver, but we saw the strength of that Infernal Drake slowly giving him that extra attack power. And the the utter decimation that we saw on that fight was without even Crecius being there. Like he wasn't even there until the butt end of that fight when they deleted uh Nya Kitty, right? Like it was it's crazy. They have so much damage already. And you saw there, with that Zaya, she he has the ability to use her Feather Storm to get out of those desperate situations. He got landed, the hook landed right on top of him from the Nautilus. He was not in a good position, was able to use that to disengage, get back into better positioning, and then use those piercing feathers to cut through the enemy team of LC, uh, LSU. And that's the interesting thing. Captain Bright didn't even have to use his flash during that fight. Like, his flash is still up. It's still available. Like, that is how strong that disengages on Zaya. And combined with the CC that Murder is the Word and Pathanax and Andrew have, like, there's just so much peel available for him on top of what's built into his kit that it's going to be really, really hard to catch Captain oh, Bright during wow. these fights. Can just see the burst from this Victor already. Has that Lich Bane, can add the procs after that Q, and they also have a Baron, and they also still have this Rift Herald. They're looking to siege down a second tier tower. Yeah, this is gonna be a lot of damage. Oh. Look at that. That is insane. This this turret is definitely down. I don't think LSU should hang around. Oh, they did though, and that could cost them. Captain Bright is still in that backside, able to put out so much damage. They take down Victor. That's a huge member. But guess what? ADC still alive. The Maokai ultimate going through the rest of the team, stunning them up. Pathrax is going to pick up a kill. That's going to be two, three members going down for LSU. And now they're looking to siege onto this inhib tower, possibly take the inhib itself. Yeah, Crecius was just grievously out of position, but the rest of that fight was executed flawlessly by Texas A&M. I'm really confused why LSU felt the need to try to stay there. Once you see the Rift Herald come out, and it, it's a full health Rift Herald that's going to slam directly into your Tier 2 turret, like, you should just move back. Like, don't try to defend that, you'll lose, especially with the heavy engage coming out of Pathronex and Andrew. Like, you should just, you should take a step back and reevaluate what you're trying to do by standing in that turret besides getting caught. Now, we got to this point here about 24 minutes into the match. You have a 12,000 gold lead. 
how fast you clear out this game now is a really good indicator about the team's strength. We saw this yesterday where I believe it was Ole Miss let the game drag on almost a little too long. It was about an extra seven to ten minutes where they didn't really need to. They could have just pulled the trigger. And I want to see how Texas does in this situation. I think Texas, after they get after they pick up this Drake and get their next buy, they should definitely pressure this bot lane because Victor is starting to push that out. And so it would be smart to see them start to rotate towards that and just take out the second tier turret. With that middle inhib down, it's going to be really, really hard for LSU to try to defend that because they're going to have to have somebody in that mid lane to stop these super minions from bearing down on top of them, as well as having Andrew up here in this top lane actually split pushing because he has his teleport available. He can join fights from that top lane. And the thing is, I, I a lot of people like to send their top laner into this mid lane to deal with the minions because they usually do have a teleport. But the thing about Nautilus is he has a really slow time pushing those waves back, especially super minions. So if he does in the middle of pushing those waves back, have to roam down bot, he only stalls out the rest of the minions to make a really huge wave to siege into the base if they lose a fight. Yeah, and that's, that's really tricky. I would be concerned if I was LSU and really talking about like, what should our strategy be to try to kind of deal with this, especially if they do keep split pushing that Maokai in the top lane and they're forcing, you know, uh, forcing or Texas A&M is forcing LSU to really make these hard choices. I'm not sure I'm OK with this dance that they're doing here in the top, but it, they do have a wave crashing in bot as well as Sejuani looking like she's going to try to maybe steal some juggle. But here's a, maybe a little scuffle in the top lane. Andrew was thinking about it. He almost had the backside available to him of the LSU defense up here, but decided not to pull that trigger just yet. They're gonna wait for another minion wave to come on, crash on, and they don't have that Baron buff, but guess who flanked from behind? It's the Sejuani. You never walk alone in some trouble right now. They're still fighting underneath the turret. No one has gone down just yet. Captain Bright not taking aggro. It's on the Sejuani. That's who it is. Kreech just will pick up a kill onto Twitch below. Captain Bright is godlike on this Zaya, and now they're taking down this turret. Yeah, that's so big. They caught out the Twitch, got the kill that they needed to. Once Oriana blew her command shockwave, the damage burst wasn't there for at least another six seconds. And by that point, it was too late. And it does look like oh. HTP is going to get deleted here. Captain goes legendary. The turret is going to fall. This inhibitor to follow suit. They have minions in the base. Not a lot of the supers actually are on that Nexus Tower. Texas A&M, they want to look at trying to close out this game. They must have heard our calls. They want to see how fast they can close this one out at 27 minutes on the Nexus Tower. Captain Bright picks up his ninth kill of the game. That's the last Nexus Tower. Nexus wide on open. Featherstorm used by Captain Bright to try and keep that team from having any chance of defending this. Nautilus in the front line, but what can they do? LSU, they have been defeated. They take out the Zaya, but that's not the issue. You have minions on the Nexus right now. Beast goes on in, slowly going to wither away, and Texas A&M take game one. That was such a decisive victory by Texas A&M. Aside from a couple of what I would say, just not necessarily early game missteps, but just a couple of like, uh, so Pan Panther Nax didn't quite get the gank that he needed or a little bit of a misplay by Kernicious, by, by Kreishas maybe not being in the position that he needed to be into. Texas A&M played that so strong. And Captain Bright, once he got that small lead and that, like, that small CS lead and then kind of built on that with one or two kills, he really showed how dominant he is on that Zaya. And it makes me wonder if they're either going to ban out Zaya or actually prioritize banning out that Rakan for this next game. It's going to be interesting to see because I found the Rakan wasn't super impactful when it came to the lane. It was mainly just Captain Bright getting himself a CS lead. He got about 30 CS at around that 12 minute mark and was well ahead of his opponent. Same thing for that victor in that mid lane. Usually Oriana is that kind of champion that can keep up with CS. All she has to really do is throw out a Q, put down the W, and then shield on back. And she usually can clear the wave with one item. But I feel like this victor and their, their mid and bot lane just kind of outclassed LSU. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at Oriana's final items, right, all she ended with was a Morel, a Namakon, and a Banshee's Veil. She was starved for gold almost the entire game, only ending at 178 CS and 5 assists. She didn't have anything that she needed to do to get going. Like, Star-Lord just didn't have it to, to try to get those items, and the game amped up way too quickly for that to not be a problem for them. Like, there was just, there was nothing there to really help Star-Lord out in terms of damage because Nyakiti took a bunch of abuse hit by that from from captain bright and from murder is the word well 
We're going to go ahead, take a quick break, set up game two here between LSU and Texas A&M. Will Texas be able to close out this series, secure their position into the knockout stage with Captain Bright? Or will LSU pull up an upset and at least cause a little bit of some issues for Texas? Stick around, guys. We'll be right back. in my life. Baby, baby, baby. 
And welcome, everybody, back to the cast here at AVGL. I'm Alexander O'Piel. Shambo joining me is Brian Starkey. And Brian, game one we just saw between Texas and LSU. That was just a very great display of skill by Texas. Yeah, Texas Texas was banging that game. And so much so that Captain Bright Zaya actually was the very first band that LSU did at the beginning of this game, too. Like, he just went so ham. I think he ended, what, 9-1-5 and five at that end of game one. And so, like, taking away that Zaya, it just means that they it wasn't even the Rakan zaya combo that they were scared of. It was literally just the Zaya that they were like, we can't even allow this to be in the game at all. Get rid of it. 
No, it was great positioning. It had a lot of safety in her kit with that Feather Storm. They couldn't lock down Captain Bright at all, and it allowed him just to rip through that team with the piercing feathers. Absolute god on that champion. I think it was in the end 9 2 and 6. Had a ridiculous okay. score line. But uh, we're already into those we picks do. and bans. On the other side here, Texas, they're going ahead. They don't want to see that John again. Going to pick a zillion ban as well as a Lee Sin ban here. So maybe some target bans coming up. Yeah, so the Zillion ban is interesting for me. I don't see him being a a large power pick right now. Maybe it is a target ban. The Lee Sin is always a safe ban. If you're just saying, I don't want to deal with somebody who knows how to play Lee Sin, let's just get rid of him. I mean, because there's a lot of champions that you can play an alternative to Lee Sin. Uh, and like you talked about, that Kane getting banned out, as well as in game one, Kane was banned. You said that we saw him, uh, I believe it was yesterday, mm -hmm. where he was paid to really great effects. And so maybe it's just LSU trying to take away some of these champions that they've seen be so successful and just like, we don't even want to try to mess with that. Yeah, Kane, kind of a weird one. He When he initially came out, he didn't really impress anybody. But if he's able to get a lead, use those unique gank paths as he can yeah. take into the lanes, he can really snowball out of control, especially with that Shadow Assassin. If you're able to get a lot of kills early, there's really no way of coming back if you look to end the game. But now we're starting to get some picks in here. It looks like LSU are going to swap it up right now. They're going to pick up a Jarvan and a Gragas for them. And it looks like... On the other side here for Texas, they're going to go ahead and pick up that Maokai. Yeah, so the Maokai is actually just kind of a throwback to that first game where Andrew just played that Maokai. We saw a couple of what I would say debatable uh, engages from him. Pathernax actually getting that Sejuani as well, so they have that full peel line they had in that game one uh, for the side of Texas A&M. Uh, I want to touch on real fast the Gragas and the Jarvan, though. Jarvan was actually banned out in the second round of bans in that game one. Uh, and he is making an appearance here, and I actually really like Jarvan. I feel like on this new patch, he's going to shift more towards that kind of warrior and kind of that tank where he will kind of like a, a Darius Bruiser, I want to say, kind of like when he first came out. Uh, Jarvan being able to have that kind of strong, uh, you know, whack you with his thing, get some good engage, get some good CC with his ult. There's a lot of good stuff there, and I feel like it works really well with Gragas being able to engage there. And then Tristana being picked up by Captain Bright. I feel like it's going to be super sick because not only does he kind of have that same mobility with his W and the ability to shred turrets because he was always on the front line of every single turret, but now he has resets to just keep fighting over and over again. Yeah, I feel like that kind of suits his play style because he's able to play on the side here and pick up a couple kills. And then he really liked to go aggressive with that Feather Storm if he hadn't used it yet to try and pick off more kills with that Tristana. Going to have those jumps, able to get deep into those fights. Just got to be careful on positioning. Now, we also see a couple more bands coming out. They didn't like that Rakan. They felt like that was also another major issue. Rather not see the Lovers Duo at all in that bot lane and follow it up with the same Syndra last ban. Yeah, and then the Kogma actually getting banned out is a smart decision, too. We saw Kogma oh. in the first game of the day today, uh, and he was played extremely well. And then the Twitch ban actually coming out as well. It looks like they didn't like the fact that Nyak Kitty did find, I think, he found some good damage. He never found kills, but he did find good damage. And with the Gragas and the Braum and the J4, like if they rounded that out with an Orianna, uh, giving Nyak Kitty the uh, Twitch again would be very bad. Yeah, and I also think it's to try and limit the hyper carries available for them to answer with. Really, Tristana was the last mm. one up for them, and they decided to take that away. Also, have the ability to siege down towers. They're also going to repick that Victor. So, pretty much the identical same team, except for this bot lane, which had to be changed by bans. Yeah, I'm curious to see what they decide to do here with their support. I would have suggested a Braum in this composition, but since the Braum got picked up by LSU, I'm curious to see what they choose to go with here. They could run... Uh, Bard actually is Ooh. a good one. Uh, <laughs> I actually really like Bard. That provides so much mobility for Sejuani and Maokai. Like, they can have so many crazy paths using that magical journey coming out of Bard that I feel like it's just going to be so aggressive especially because Murd is the word picked up that ignite instead of running an exhaust now the final pickup here for lsu is actually going to be this sivir sivir one of those adcs that doesn't really mind if you have a front line because once she gets that crit into her uh, build as well as the ricochet going she can actually just slice through an entire team though i kind of find it questionable because if she dies here it's mainly only a jarvan left for physical damage and i feel like he needs to be a bit tanky in this situation 
I think the nice thing about Jarvin is that he actually does scale up pretty well in terms of uh, what you could pick in, in, in terms of Bruiser's top laner. Uh, Bruiser's in the top lane. Like, J4 has some very natural tanky stats. He's got his W that provides him a shield based on how many enemies are around him. And he's also able to basically build into armor items after he picks up whether he chooses to go for the Titanic or that Black Cleaver early on. Once he gets that item, he can really just roll right into whatever tank items he wants. And if he really just wants to go straight tank, he doesn't even have to get that Black Cleaver if he doesn't want to. He can go for, you know, a Sterix or something like that and, and kind of opt around that Black Cleaver and give himself more of the tanky stats than the damage stats. But I think he'll be able to survive, especially with the peel that you have coming out of Braum and Gragas from HD Beast in Time to Bomb. And you also have that Orianna Shockwave combo. Get that Jarvan into the middle of a Cataclysm. Give them no way of getting out if they don't have any summoners and really just rip apart that team. But that does require a lot of team synergy here. And they're kind of all over the place in a lot of these fights last game. So they're going to have to tighten up that core and really try and solidify this in game two. Yeah, I think the interesting thing that you touched on is the communication among the teams. Uh, while we did see some very questionable decisions coming out in terms of positioning and, and picking up fights by the side of LSU, the, I mean, the same could be said of Texas A&M. They got caught out in a couple of fights and were only be able to were only able to be carried through some of them on the back of Captain Bright playing that Zaya and being very smart about his positioning going into those fights. Like we saw, I think in the last three major fights. In that last game, Cretius got picked pretty heavily on that victory. He was kind of out of position, maybe trying to be too aggressive, maybe trying to get a flank, but he died very early on in those fights, and so it could have been a very different story had Captain Bright not got going so quickly on that Zaya. And you know, that was the, another thing here, is Star-Lord on this Orianna. You gotta have a much better lane phase, especially in this game, you being the solo AP damage here for magic on your team you got to be able to keep up with this victor because he fell behind quite early in game one around 30 to 36 cs at about the 10 minute mark that's not a thing you want to be saying about an oriana yeah and and we touched on that at the little uh, a little bit at the end of the last game is oriana had two items by the end of that game she had banshee's veil and morella namicon and then tier one boots like she didn't have any of the items she needed to do any damage to anybody. <laughs> like, I mean, literally anyone. Like, she could even if she caught Rakan or Zaya, like the damage just wasn't there for her shockwave and her dissonance combo to do any damage. Like, she needs to have a better laning phase. She needs to at least not necessarily get a CS lead, but she needs to keep up. She cannot fall 20 CS behind this game. Otherwise, like, we're just gonna see a repeat of the last game where Cretius is gonna get a huge lead, build that victor really quick. And then Captain Bright's going to get some, probably some good damage as long as he plays safe with that bard. And, you know, you might see a repeat of that game because there's still the same peel available for Texas A&M with Sejuani and Maokai. And the same re-engage, we talked about it last time, and we saw that multiple times, especially during that top lane fight where they got a catch onto Captain Bright. He was mm -hmm. able to stall that out with a Feather Storm, and then immediately, the rest of the team started coming back. Yeah, the Sejuani ult that zoned them from behind. They weren't able to move back without getting slowed, and then you had that Maokai ult just sweep through the team and just clean up with Captain Bright dealing out so much damage. Yeah, I mean... It there's a lot of adjustments that I feel like LSU needs to make coming into this game to, to kind of like swipe it out from under the, under the feet of Texas A&M. I think they can do it because Texas A&M, while they looked very dominating, it was like we said, it was on the back of really one character. Like Andrew got caught, Cretius got caught. Like they were really able to survive by Captain Bright. So if they're able to, if LSU is able to really kind of find their rallying point and dig deep and, and kind of, figure out what it was that didn't work for them in that last game, aside from team compositions. Like, what were they doing strategically wrong in, in terms of communication? Can they fix those in time for this game? I think that's going to be the big turning point. Well, we'll have to see what LSU can do here in game two of the best of two as they take on Texas. Texas looking to sweep this series, solidify a final position into the bracket rounds coming up next week. So if they can, they're really in a good spot right now. Really, no one can really touch them for that second place uh, slot in their division. So with that, guys, make sure to leave your thoughts in the chat. Who do you think is going to be able to take this one? Will LSU be able to at least steal one game back and maybe upset Texas chances? Or will Texas solidify it and dominate like they did last game? You know, we talked about this a little bit in terms of like nerves, right? Like does, will Texas A&M have any nerves coming into this game? Because 
you, you said they have to win both of these games to really solidify that second place spot. And we talked about how the Texas A&M A team had a lot of experience on that kind of riot, big collegiate stage to kind of come in with those clutch moments and make stuff happen. But does their B team have it? And right now, like you talked about, the infrastructure is there for Texas A&M to kind of build around that. And it looks like this B team, they, they have the potential to really like clutch this out, not give into pressure, make strong decisions and, and maybe finish this out. It's a cool, cool little fact here. Texas in particular, the state, a lot of their collegiate teams actually are starting to get a lot of support from different sponsors. I know uh, North Texas actually just invested uh, half a million into an esports arena that allowed them to pretty much allow a space for their teams to play in scrim. And now uh, we see Texas A&M really showing off that they have the ability to create these really good rosters as we load on in here to see our final game of the day at ABGL. On your blue side, it is Texas A&M and LSU, L LSU on the red side. <laughs> You'll get there, Ooh. I swear. You have I'm, all, I, <laughs> I'm close. I, I keep, I don't know why, but I always see a C when I look at that S, but you know what they oh. might be seeing? This in vain. Oh. We got a oh big fight to start us off. The Bard Sun is going to land. Panthrox taking a lot of damage. HD Beats has to flash away. Death Ray was able to cut straight through that team. Andrew Wanted to keep it going, and both junglers actually on the worst end of that fight. Yeah, so that's actually really interesting. Uh, aside from both junglers kind of getting the, the the damage, I'm interested in the summoner spells that came out from the bot lane. Uh, Murd is the word, actually burned his ignite to try to finish off HD Beast, and Nya Kitty to negate that ignite damage had to burn his heal. He is now healless in the bot lane. That is a huge summoner spell to be without especially with the kind of engage and positioning that we saw Murd as the word and Captain Bright and the pressure that they had in that last game, that heal makes a very large difference, especially because Pathernax plays that Sejuani so well and his ganking is so solid. And especially when you're going to, against quite a, a, usually quite an aggressive support in the name of Bard. And if murder is the word, can show up big on this champion. I find Bards have the ability to solo carry a lane as long as he's able to land those snares. Yeah, and the interesting thing is once he gets a lane going, he has so much roam potential, right? He's a he's a roam support, like the actual definition of a roam support, using that magical journey, having to pick up those chimes all over the map. Like there's a lot of stuff that Bard can do if he's able to really kick his lane off, it becomes a nightmare of a game to play in if that Bard is good at what he does. And especially too, roaming supports have been a big key factor in these rounds, in these matches over the last couple days is uh, we saw a lot of Alistars roaming to that mid lane quite early to try and get their mid laner ahead. And that could be a possibility here with this Bard to try and get that Victor to a place where he was last game dominating that lane. And, and that, that's a really good direction to go in, in my opinion, it is, is to get Cretius going on that Victor. Because we saw how dominating and how easy he was able to assert his dominance in that lane once he got going. He really bullied out Star-Lord playing that Orianna. And, I mean, Captain Bright playing Tristana, he is that hyper carry, so he's going to get going pretty quick. And it's just a matter of how quick they ramp. But the nice thing about Sejuani is how quick she can get from lane to lane and gank in each lane and at least burn summoners and then go do something else and come back and gank again. Like Sejuani is such a strong ganker that like she can really change the course of this fight or this, and this game. What's a little concerning here is how slow luckily HD Beast finally did finish off that red buff. I was about to be concerned because Sejuani was looking to look to head up to the top lane, but did turn around there. I was gonna be interested to see if Beast could match her there but she's going to go ahead and just clear out that Scuttle Crab because I found the, the jungle clear here from Beast was just a little slow. He decided to try and do a full clear, very similar to both junglers, actually. And we actually do see Sejuani pinging it to come into that mid lane, maybe get that pressure like you were talking about. Uh, I, I like the sentiment, but once Sejuani scouts out these Raptors not being there, I'd be very cautious. Get your wards down and then get out because you don't want to hang out there for too long. Ooh, Captain Bright playing risky right now. Gets a lot of damage. Meanwhile, in mid lane, there is that gank. It forces the flash out from Star-Lord. Still has that barrier available, but doesn't have any way of getting out any kind of CC path. Yeah, and that's what we, that's what I was just talking about, right? Like her ability, Sejuani's ability to burn summoners on every single gank if she does it right, sets herself up to be such a success, successful, like early to mid game ganker where she can just throw down all of this damage and do all of this stuff when everyone hits level six, that it's just going to be so difficult for anybody to get out of if they don't have 
their key summoners, and in, in, in the case of Oriana, it is most definitely her flash. Now, what to get rid of that? She's an easy gank target. Murders the word, just trying to feather a snare or two through the minions. Just gonna keep on him. Those, those are fine for right now. Still not a whole lot of action otherwise, but I feel like once we hit level six in this bot lane, there's gonna be a really bloody bla a bath of uh, fights going on here. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, like, there's so much, there's so much uh, aggressiveness already coming out of this Texas a and bot lane. Like, they, they aren't in what I would say a, like, they're not winning and they're not losing. Like, Tristana is a couple behind in CS, but they're playing so aggressive, they're bullying them around. Tristana hasn't even had to use or her health potion yet, where uh, Sipper hasn't had to use hers, but Braum has used all of his, and actually, here Look comes this Murders the word can just use that. Captain Bright actually turned around to auto. Does have that jump to get out of there. And that's the great thing about Bard here is if you get enough info with that vision on early, you should be able to get out of a lot of gang pass. And that and that's what I love. I love that about Bard. Like he he really provides you a lot of safety in lane, as well as giving you so much potential, like we talked about, to roam and to make things happen around the map that a lot of other supports don't give you. And Tristana actually is what I would say a, a more safe ADC to leave alone just because of how far her rocket jump can take her and how quickly she can just pop that off. She sees something she doesn't like, she gets out, she's done. Well, Cretius is gonna get knocked up there by HD Beast. Not a whole lot's gonna come out of it. We're already starting to see a bit of a CS difference starting to grow in this mid lane. It's very small, only about 10 CS, but that is not a good sign here early. Yeah, and that actually gets really tricky because we're starting to see a CS in every lane except for the uh, except for the bot lane where Tristana is actually only seven CS behind Sivir. So one one wave behind Sivir, and you know that's honestly not that bad. You, you know, especially because J4, like you said, he does need to get going, but he has some innate stats to carry him through. But he needs that CS early game to to get those one or two items that we talked about to make something happen and survive it is a while before that shield starts to stack and before the the damage and the items really kind of start to come out well, we're starting to see the first backs here from texas they're able to pick up an upgraded hex core there for the victor and Cretius, and gotta be a sword for that tristana gonna have a little bit more damage doesn't really start to do a lot of dps until she gets one or two attack speed components but with that steroid built into her kit she can do pretty well early yeah it it, it, it can start to hurt, right? You pick up that BF sword, you pop your Q, you get your uh, your time bomb down onto somebody, and you just sit there and pepper them, right? Even if, like, if Bard gets a stun out, that's even better, man. You just keep pepper and pepper and peppering, and then shoot your ult and an explosion, and they're donezo. Like, they're dead. There's nothing you can do about it. You got stunned. Like, Brom Shield can't save you. Nothing can save you. It's just, it's really tricky. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what this level six looks like coming out of Bird is the Word and Captain Bright. I know we've talked about it a couple of times, but I'm just so excited to actually see it that I, I just can't wait for it to get there. Yeah, if you can land that Tempered Fate, engage with it possibly, or even just pick off members. That's another great thing about Bard. We talk about Bard. This seems to be the Bard like fan hour at the moment, but <laughs> he has so much in his kit that he can do. He can engage, he can disengage, he can dive, he can heal, he can teleport you across different places. It's it's. It kind of makes you think it might be a little overloaded in the kit. <laughs> it really joggins your noggins, as they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I think I think the interesting thing is that we haven't seen really a lot come out of out of the junglers. We saw one failed gank in that bot lane coming out from uh, HD Beast, and we saw a good gank in the mid lane from Pathernax, but we really haven't seen much besides that because the ward control has been so strong. And then the junglers, like, once they get spotted by a ward, they just, like, don't bother coming back to lane for another three minutes and just keep farming in their jungle. So I think that's, uh, I find that interesting considering how much presence both of the junglers tried to have in the beginning of the last game. They're definitely tapering off in, in how much presence they're trying to lay down now. Well, Captain has to jump away. Just, you mentioned that vision control. Look at this bot side river. I think it's five or six wards from Texas A&M, two of them being control wards, because Murderous Ward doesn't even have a Sightstone yet. They're looking to go aggressive, Saver, flash on it, Buster Shot gonna pick up the first blood with that bomb coming on down from Captain Bright. And now this Tristana hits that level six, looking to go off all over again in this game. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was talking about. Like, 
once you get the that Tristana, she lands that explosive, pops her Q, and then just peppers you with shots, and Brom can't do anything because he's stunned up too. Hang oh. on. Yeah, in the mid lane, Star-Lord has to use that ultimate to try and disengage. Kreisius, though, with the final tick of the Chaos Storm, picks up the kill. And now both carries for Texas A&M have kills in their lane. Maybe another one here on bot side gets stunned up. Goomba stomps on in. Captain will pick up the kill. It looks like Bard able to just get out of tower range at the very end, and Murder will survive. Yeah, I mean... This bot lane is going kind of what we, almost exactly to what we described would start happening if this, if uh, if Bard was able to land his Qs and able to get around and get these flanks. Like his Qs are the whole. Hang on. Oh, down in bot side, beautiful tempered fade, able to keep that ADC alive. They might try and turn it around on HDBs. The Thunderlord's Brox. Here comes the 20 from behind from the river. HDBs gets taken down. Meanwhile, there was a teleport from Andrew. Actually, they pick up a kill and clean up this bot side of LSU. Man, that was a huge teleport. Like that was actually a really smart move and a really smart call out coming from Texas A&M. If you look at Andrew. Or I'm sorry, not Andrew, uh, Wardna, his teleport is down and he used that teleport to get back into top lane. So unless he's able to get a ton of damage down onto this turret, like that is definitely not a worthwhile teleport. Like they lost a lot for him using that to get back into lane. Well, they're going to pick up that Mountain Drake head on back. Texas A&M sitting quite comfortable here with about a 3,000 gold lead at the 11 minute mark. Rift Herald now possibly a target if they're able to take out this bot side turret and a Tristana with a Mountain Drake, you're just sitting there happy. Yeah, like that is that is so nasty. That's such a nasty first Drake for the side of Texas A&M. They have got to be so happy with the way this game is going right now. Like you're a, about 11 and a half minutes in and you have a 3,000 gold lead, five kills, and you have kills on the people you want kills on, right? Like Sejuani, Maokai, but really the Victor and the Tristana are really where you want those kills. Two kills on Tristana. Tristana having, uh, I think, an 80% kill participation right now. Being on four of the five kills, she has gold. She's sitting on gold. Like She has the Zeal, the BS Sword, like the Crit Cloak. And hang on, here comes Bard again. Oh, that was a beautiful play there. Kitty has to flash on out, but the Explosive Charge going to tick on down. Captain Bright picks up his third kill of the game. Looking for his fourth. He's going to jump on him. Buster shot. That's a double kill for this Tristana. Beast up in top side, but he doesn't have the Jarvan to support him. Actually, Andrew smacking him back in the middle of the air. Beast doesn't really have much left in the tank. He's looking just to keep Andrew busy for this Jarvan to come on over. Looks like Andrew should be just fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really questioning Wardna in the top lane right now. I, I mean, he saw that Gragas was coming in. He very obviously had a solid catch onto Maokai. Maokai didn't have his flash because he had to burn it in the last engagement in the bot lane. I mean, there was really, hang on, here comes the Tempered Fate coming out of... Ooh, Ooh, but the shockwave is what's going to do the damage path just gets out with his life. And at least this Star Lord on the Orianna might be down 30 CS, but finally picks up a kill for himself. Cretius might be the next target. Warda flashes on in, but guess what? Captain Bright is also their beast goes on into the pit as well. They don't have an Orion ultimate, but here comes on the hunt from that Sivir. Now Kitty now trying to chase down this victor and they're able to trade back another kill there. In the end, LSU not slowing down and not going to be taking it just in there. Man, Pathanax has been escaping every single one of these fights with like 30 health. It's insane how close he's keeping every one of these fights. Every time he's in one, he knows exactly how much damage he can take before he needs to get out. Well, Andrew getting chased down here. Werner maybe decides against it. Really, we haven't talked too much about this top lane. We haven't seen much action. Andrew has been building up a bit of a CS lead over Warna, with Warna going around trying to make some flanks happen, only has the one assist to show for it. And at the, just look at this bot lane right now. You can see just an outclass in items, an Infinity Edge and a Zeal to just the BF and a Warhammer. Still gonna be a couple more minutes before that Essence Reaver is finished. I mean, that, that's gotta feel so bad as your bot lane. Like you were doing so well keeping up. You were actually ahead in CS for a while. And then there was just that really good fight in that bot lane where Pathernex had such a strong rotation and then Captain Bright was able to get two kills and then he got another two kills. He just kept, like, that's something that I think Captain Bright has 
that nobody else in this game has right now is his ability to, like, once he gets a lead, he hangs on to it and he knows how to build it so well that it becomes a nightmare to play against. And I didn't even get to mention this. We talked about the Bard. There was a really nice play when he used that uh, magical journey over the wall. He actually used his auto attack first before using his Q to stun up Kitty. Because Kitty used that sh spell shield on the auto attack instead of the stun. And that's what caught it out, especially with that Sejuani alt landing. Yeah, that actually, that was that was incredibly smart. I saw that, but I didn't pick up on it. That was That's a really good call out because of the way Braum's passive works, where he hits you with those meeps and does a slow off of it. It actually does proc that Sibber. I mean, such a smart play. So Murder showing up big on this support, especially in the lane phase. We didn't see it as much on his Recon, but the Bard showing up big times. Got those six assists of the eight kills. And is now looking to roam around, cause some difficulty for the rest of LSU. Yeah, we, we talked about how impactful this Bard could be, right? Like, you called it the Bard fan hour. I, I mean, it, it is really true. Like, he has, he has done oh. so much in this game. Speaking of so much, so close is that Sejuani ultimate. The knock-up, though, will land. But guess what? They say we are hungry for some Bard blood. He's going to get stunned inside his own pit. Uses the magical journey. Here comes a TP from Andrew, though, to try and answer Beast in a bad spot right now. Andrew throws up the saplings to slow him back down. Flash on in. Beast going down solo right now. He will die in the bush to that Sejuani. And now looking at possibly this tower in top lane. Looking for a dive. They're going to go for Werner right now. There is four members on top of this Jarvan. He gets taken down by Captain Bright. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing you can do. And then you have Tristana there. She can put a bomb on top of that and shred that turret. That turret is done. We're going to see the second turret of the game going over to the side of Texas A&M, and very de deservedly so. They have done such a good job of rotating around this map as a team and then impacting lanes just by having them passively push. Like, look at bot lane. That is pushing towards that turret. And then after they pick up this Rift Tail, it should be coming back towards them. I mean, it's just going to be like they have such control over this game at such a micro and macro level that LSU is going to have a really hard time trying to at least even regain their footing to start thinking about a comeback right now. And this is going to be a difficult one. 7,000 gold at 16 and a half minutes. Picked up a Rift Herald as well. Looking to really siege on in. They might even do the combo they did last game where they pick up a Baron buff at the same time if they're confident enough to do it. Captain Bright gets a little bit chunked out underneath that tower. Looks like the bomb will not finish it off because there's no minion. Shockwave is going to land. Knockup lands on all the back line of Texas, but it's not enough. They're still alive. On the hunt is pop to try and disengage. Time to bomb. Might be getting taken down there by the Chaos Storm. And there's so many slow, low health members. Captain Bright still has that buster shot. Man, that fight was extremely close, and I think they were only able to force LSU off that peel because of the amount of burst damage that came out of Cretius on that victor. Oh. If that landed there, that would have been deadly, but Aww. the sun does. And here comes the Maokai ultimate. No one is down just yet. And now Captain Bright can start jumping off. There is a double kill for that Maokai. Captain Bright will pick one up of his own. And that's three members of LSU taken down by their second tier tower. I mean, look at these flashing health bars. Andrew has incredibly low health. Murd is the word has incredibly low health. These Texas A&M players are so smart about being able to know when they should stop. Like, at what point should I get out of the fight? And then at what point can I go back in to throw some CC down and then run away again? Like, that is an extremely useful skill to have as a, as a high level player is to be able to understand when you can and cannot go back into a fight. And Texas A&M, they have a really good idea of how to do that right now. Well, that Cloud Drake is going to be there. There's another mountain coming on out quite shortly here. Might be looking to get and stack up those dragons like we saw last game. Still not looking too good here for LSU. They haven't been able to take in a structure yet either. Still so much standing gold available to them, but they need to find a pick here. And being so far behind, it takes so long to try and whittle away one of these tougher, tankier opponents that they're likely to find. Yeah, and that's that's going to be the real struggle for LSU. Like, you, to, to win one of these fights, you need to get Cretius and you need to get Captain Bright. But Murd is the word is doing such a good job landing those cues, and pa uh, Pathernax is doing such a good job of peeling for those carries that they're not going to have a fun time trying to do that. Like, even if they have the vision and they know, like, hey, this person's going to be here, we have to go for it. Like, nobody on the side of Texas A&M is ever alone to where they can't get out of uh, a situation with without somebody else helping them. Well, pushing on up, Andrew 
just trying to keep up the pressure on that side lane. Beast and them wandering back to their second tier tower. Baron gonna be up in about 40 seconds here. But you know what, Texas might not even look to that objective if they can find another fight, because they are still so aggressive early here that they are not afraid to dive. I wouldn't blame them. Like they have such a strong dive comp right now with how strong Andrew and Pathernax are. They have they have all the items they need to be able to basically bust through this front line of LSU and just not even not even care about what's in their way and just go straight for those backline targets. Looks like we have a bit of a dance going on here around the dragon pit. No dragon up on the table to take, but it was really close. Looked like Braum and Beast actually were going very aggressive, almost dived into that uh, Texas side jungle. They decided against it, just trying to get those wards down. But you can see now the line of wards starting to surround the Baron Pit up in topside river and a Rift Herald in the bot lane. And, and that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense for them to pull that out. Because once they secure this, they're going to have such an easy time of securing this dragon control, which they really, really want because it is a second. It is going to be a second mountain trick. Well, looks like they're able to interrupt that Rift Herald just enough to keep it off the tower. Tower very close to going down, though. It's going to take one or two waves to really finish that off if no one attends to it. Cretius, though, might be caught out. This was something we mentioned last game. Shockwave going to land. They're not even going to use the Cataclysm. And Ward now picks up the kill. Bright trying to kite on back. Is able to push away that Braum. Murders the Ward, gets stunned up in the wall. He's able to get away. This could be bad here, but here comes Sejuani over the wall. Looking to find some kills. Time to bomb. Looking to go on down. Patrax picks up the kill on a killing spree. Captain Bright jumping on in picks up the tower. And like that, Texas able to turn around what looked like a good catch there for the side of LSU. Yeah, and, and that was that was one of those occasions where I said Cretius does tend to get caught out quite a bit. And it was the pick that they needed, but unfortunately they weren't able to secure Murd as the word. And so he was just able to kite around like three of the members of LSU. And the other two were just trying to fight and they couldn't do it. There was nothing there for them to try to finish off or, or basically try to kill Captain Bright because he was just so good with Patharax there doing the damage, throwing down that ult, putting the CC and peeling for Captain Bright that they were they just had no bright out of there. You have this Tristan and now 7, 1, and 5. 12 of the 14 kills has been involved in, has the Static Shiv, has the Berserk Greaves, went a Zeal item as well, is going to be attacking over that two tax a second with that steroid in her kit, who's going to be able to tear through these fights. And that's, that's going to be so nasty because she now has that static shiv uh, and that IE like you were talking about. It's just going to, she's going to shred people. Like even if Braum shield is up, static shiv procs still go off. And that's just going to, it's going to basically, if she lands a crit on one of those, she can hit everybody in the team for a chunk of damage and just follow up with that over and over again. We've seen how strong Captain Bright is with positioning. It's going to be pretty awful to, or, Pretty awful for LSU, pretty great for us to see how strong he's able to play on this Tristana hyper carry. And Texas right now, they can just do this. Keep the ward coverage going. Try and catch out a member. They're going to see Beast actually back there. They might pull the trigger immediately onto Baron. They know that that jungler went on back. And guess what? They haven't even touched that trinket ward. I don't know if they know this is happening just yet. Now they will see it as Texas secures a Baron. I mean, that was such a safe Baron. You have vision of HD Beast going back, like pull the trigger on that for sure. Cause now you have Baron control. You can push some waves, get a couple towers. And if you win a fight, rotate down, pick up the Mountain Drake. And then all of a sudden Tristana is unstoppable in killing these and killing the remaining towers that are here on the map. Pathrax gonna come around the corner. HD Beast fans on the ultimate. The Sejuani one doesn't miss though. Star Lord gets taken out there. The Spart Lunning Oriana. Beautiful temper fate gonna catch out two members. Captain Bright jumping on and flashes forward for that Zimmer. Picks up a kill. They take down the Jarvan. And three members of LSU are going down. Beast and Time Bomb might soon follow. Bomb under the tower. Double kill for Captain Bright. And now the second tier tower will fall. It's just Beast trying to hold down the fort, but he might not be enough. This is such a huge wipe coming out of Texas A&M that they oh very well my. could just end the game here. Like, and they the, get these. Yeah, they have they have high health bars. The only person who's actually really hurting on the side of Texas A&M is this bard. And they could, if they wanted to be really bold, they could try to finish it, or they could rotate and get the Baron minions and try to take this mid-tower inhibitor. Which it looks Although, like they're gonna do. 
Looks like they do. The Captain Bright on this Tristana can just rip these apart. We mentioned it earlier. You see it going down. A second inhibitor falling in LSU's base as Texas really open up the lead. Almost 20,000 gold. I mean, that's... Yeah, Texas is unstoppable at this point. It does look like they're going to go for that Drake, pick that up, and then basically, it's basically just a... a I what I would say is just kind of like a stalling mechanism. At this point, it's it's more pop and circumstance than anything while they wait for the waves to kind of get where they need them to be and set them up for this last push, this last team fight. And I mean, from here, like, I, I think it, it's a matter of this point of just, will this be like one more fight or will this just be kind of like, we're pushing into your vase and we'll fight you a little bit and then we'll win the game. Oh, you know what? You do those kind of plays to make the coach happy. You show that you can take away any possible objectives on the way back. Play it safe. You're only at 25 minutes. You got about five minutes to really want to try and end this out to show that you're able to close out a game with this kind of gold lead. And with the double mountain Drake as well as a super fed Tristana, this should be quite easy for them to take. Most definitely. And like looking at LSU, they're just so gold starved right now. Like Oriana has one kill. Silver has one kill. And their CS is not great. Like, I mean, it, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they were just having some really rough fights and they just kept losing fights. They weren't able to CS safely. But even so, they're so gold starved where Sivir only has the Essence Reaver, a Zeal, and a Zerker Grease finished. And Oriana actually only has the Sort Boots and the Morella Namacon finished, which is only a slight head up over where she was at the end of that last game. So this, this game is going very similar in terms of storylines to how that last one went. Well, guess what? Andrew is behind the entire team. Sejuani Ultimate doesn't land there. Shockwave will pick up the kill onto Captain Bright, but guess what? He's done enough work for his team. Three members of LSU are taken down. 22 to 4 is your score for Kills Beast. Gonna add on to that. Be the 23rd fatality to Texas's kill total. They're gonna wipe out the final inhibitor, and they look to finish this one off. Yeah, with the Baron buff just running out, uh, they're not going to kill it quite as fast, but they should be just fine. They have two waves of super minions crashing down on right now. This should just be basically uh, wait the game out until they finish it because they're going to camp the fountain for champions. They just looking to add on more, amp up those KD aids, and with that, Texas with a clean 2-0 sweep to end us off for tonight. Man, that was that was such a strong set by Texas A&M. Like, so, so strong. I was extremely impressed with Pathernax and with Captain Bright. Captain Bright having a great showing on Tristana and a great showing on Zaya, and then Pathernax having two extremely solid games on Sejuani. He missed a couple of ults, but they were not ults that would make or break the game. They were ults that would maybe put them a little bit ahead, but they were already ahead by most of the times that, that they kind of whiffed a little bit that it didn't even make that big of a difference. And he did such a good job of peeling during the team fights. The Captain Bright was able to throw down so much damage and uh, Cretius was able to put down a lot of damage. He did his job extremely well. And we mentioned that mid lane matchup, Starlord on this Orianna. How would he fare in this game? Got himself a couple kills and a couple assists, but was relatively at that same point, fell behind a little bit early in the CS. We mentioned it around that six minute mark where they were just falling behind slowly and slowly, but then Texas taking fights, especially in that bot lane. Yeah, I, there was really nothing that LSU could do. Like. Uh, we touched on it a little bit during the game that once Texas A&M got these small leads, they really knew what to do with them. They got these small CS leads. They're like, okay, we have a small gold lead that puts our power spike just a little bit farther ahead of theirs. Let's go ahead and push that advantage. Let's get Pathernax down here to get a gank, right? Let's burn some summoners. Let's make some plays around the map with these small leads. And those small leads, they played them so well that they transitioned them into really strong macro plays around the map. Well, you got to say, we got to put out some highlights to Texas AM's ADC. Captain Bright, I believe his end to total for kills and deaths was 22 to 4. Absolute amazing showing in this series. That's the kind of positioning you want to see in your ADC. And that's how you can carry fights, carry games from the bot lane. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's so ideal. It, we hadn't really touched on that much, but Murd is the word is one of the big reasons that Captain Bright was actually really able to snowball the game in the way that he did. Like he had so many good stuns and, and like magical journeys to set up Pathernax in that bot lane that it actually made it look really effortless by the side of Captain Bright to just kind of like get these kills 
and kind of do whatever he wanted to do in the bot lane because Murders the Ward was so on top of landing all of the skills that he needed to to like make that happen. Well, congratulations to all the teams that won today here at AVGL. I believe that was our last game of tonight, folks. So hopefully you enjoyed the cast. I know I greatly enjoyed this, uh, Brian. It was a really awesome day. Yeah, it was a great pleasure being able to cast with you. And like, honestly, both of the sets today, we saw some really strong teams. So I'm really excited to see what happens during this next this next stage of the game. Well, we'll be back. I believe it's next Tuesday is our next uh, League of Legends broadcast day. All the teams have a day break to, uh, to a, a day break to uh, look over here. I just can see uh, I see production slowly trying to give me a ward right now. As we uh, we are going to be actually back later tonight with some more Smite uh, over on the main channel here at AVGL, nice. and then tomorrow we'll be back with some League of Legends. Fantastic. All right, guys, from me and Brian, thank you for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.